It's a beautiful day. I don't know if it's a 110 heat index as it was yesterday, but things are sure as sure as hell getting hot and heavy between these two teams. Lucas, we are on dust up number four. There has been another one since I just told you while we were in commercial break between these two teams. Guys are going to mess around and get cut out here at some point over the course of this morning. If you guys want to get involved, 615-737-1045 is the number. 615-737-1045 is how you weigh in. John Ledyard of Pewter Report is going to join us here live at the, uh, I guess this is a desk, a table. I, I tried to make this better for you. Okay, Lucas, I tried to make this better for you today. I'm doing all of this for you. I'm selfless that way. I moved away from the nice air-conditioned media tent. I moved away from Tom Brady's press conference area so that I don't have to do NPR radio today. And now I'm out here physically in the sun, just dying. So if I don't make it through, if I don't make it through this, this is on you. Just know that I sacrificed for you today. Don Ledger will join us at the 104.5 The Zone outdoor studio located in Tampa Bay. The outdoor studio. Yes, the outpost that we have here in front of the middle field at the Bucks practice facility. Uh, all of our coverage, of course, presented by Scoreboard Bar and Grill, the wide, the world's largest selection of bushwhackers. If it's as hot as it's, if it's as hot in Nashville as it is in Tampa, today would be a good day to go out to Scoreboard Bar and Grill and enjoy one of their refreshing beverages. So some things outside of, you know, uh, that I, I, I'm not going to call them fights because they're not getting in fights. That's just everybody circling up at mil- midfield, guys chirping at each other, knocking helmets, things like that. Antonio Brown got booted for a hot second and then came back out to practice because of some uh, dust ups that he was getting into with the Titans DBs. Um, it is it is definitely getting to people, the heat and the intensity, the practice out here on the field the last couple of days. Of course, they will play the Tampa Bay Buccaneers on Saturday, which you can hear right here on 104.5 The Zone, your home for Titans Radio. Uh, we're going to spend some time on, well, I don't know. There's there's chirping going on in the background, Lucas. I'm trying to see what's happening, but it doesn't, uh, it doesn't, I'm not sure. What is whether that, it's, just build up from yesterday? Because there, there was nothing like this yesterday, right? No, no. Yesterday was very, very calm. I mean, yeah, I mean, calm is probably the way, to put it, because remember, we talked about Taylor Lewan's comments. In fact, do we have that clip yesterday from Luca, uh, from Taylor Lewan on Sunday, Lucas? I hate to send you scurrying for audio that we didn't talk about prior to the show beginning, but, you know, that's how we do. We live produce the show that way. But when we talked about heading down to Tampa before the team actually made their way down to Tampa on Sunday, Taylor Lewan was the player that visited with us at the podium. And I asked him, you know, what he's most looking forward to about these joint training camp practices. And he just, he scoffed at me. He laughed at me basically because, uh, you know, what is there to enjoy about joint training camp practices? In fact, in this audio clip that you're about to hear, he called it a bloodbath. This was Taylor Lewan. Looking forward to, uh, you know, I guess the beach is down there. <laughs> like what that has a joint practice, man. It's an actual mean, bloodbath see, down there. They were obviously here a couple of years ago. Yeah. You had some reps against JPP. Mm-hmm. Obviously, not yeah. JPP, the first day of practice a couple of years ago, put an absolutely blistering move on me at one on ones. I think they posted it right after. I went one way, he went that way, and then he. I, I was caught in a damn blender for a second. But no, those guys. I mean, they're they're Super Bowl champions for a reason. They're an extremely talented team everywhere at every position. It's gonna be a it's gonna be a good time to go down there and engage where we're all at what we need to work on and and, uh, rely on the things that these coaches have taught us and what we pride ourselves in. So that was Taylor Lewan on Sunday. Yeah, we, we didn't. What, what are you giggling about? I love. There? I just love how he when he says when he, how he, the way he panders to the rest of the media. Like when oh, he answers yeah. the question, and he looks to the media like a stand up routine. Like, oh, what you going to the beaches down there? Am I right, people? Now uh, Lewan gets a pod. I mean, he's always been a show pony, but Lewan gets a podcast now. He's now he's holding holding court every time he does the uh, the podium. So yeah, he's looking around. He's doing a stand up routine. He's making fun of the making fun of my question, but it's a good question because it got a good answer about it being a bloodbath out here. Now yesterday was not a bloodbath. Yesterday was like mild paper cuts <laughs> between these two teams, but ter- certainly today the intensity has picked up. As far as guys who are not out on the field today, no AJ Brown for the second day in a row. Obviously. No Julio Jones. I would get used to that at this point. Uh, I did not see Danico Autry. Marcus Johnson also not out on the field. So the Titans' top three receivers not participating in this second day of joint training camp practices. I would not anticipate seeing them, of course, in this preseason game as well. 615-737-1045 is how you jump in. What are you looking for 
what kind of work are you looking for this team to get against the defending Super Bowl champions today? Who are you watching specifically? What one-on-one matchups? Because we've seen some really good ones, given the collection of skill position talent that the Buccaneers have on the field. The fact that they return all 22 starters from the Super Bowl roster, which is still unthinkable to me. I refuse to ever do salary cap radio ever again with the way that the Bucs just basically not broke all the rules, but found a way to make all the rules work for them in manipulating the salary cap. So from Jim Wyatt, who's got the full rundown of guys not out here, Julio Jones, A.J. Brown, Nate Davis, Ben Jones, who hasn't practiced in like a long time. And I would, you know, I don't know that concern is the word because Vrabel said they traveled everybody down here. But if Daniel Munyer has to play snaps for this team at any point during the regular season, uh, that, that ain't it, Chief. That's that's not how this – that's not going to keep the uh, the offense that scored 30.7 points per game a year ago on track. He has been – he has really, really struggled in his reserve role working with the starters uh, in the absence of Ben Jones on the practice field. So something to monitor. No Dane Cruikshank. Uh, they've had problems with the safety injuries. No Darrington Evans again. Tucker McCann, Danico Autry, as we mentioned. Matthias Farley, Jeff Swain, Marcus Johnson, and Brady Bree. So a handful of uh, Titans not participating in day two. Um, but what, I'm, what we've watched so far is hugely competitive periods between the Bucks offense, the Bucks first team offense, and the Titans starting secondary. 11-on-11s uh, have been not, not quite as intense because I think, I think the, 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 the secondary and the wide receivers, the secondary and the tight ends, the linebackers and the tight ends, they've, they've taken a lot of pride in these one-on-one opportunities. You know, you're playing in front of a crowd. Titans haven't had, haven't been able to have fans at their training camp practices because the facility's been under construction. But certainly here, they've got. I mean, they got a whole like cheering section. They got dudes walking up and down the uh, walking up and down the tents, getting people going. You got a dude decked out as a pirate, uh, getting getting leading the fans and chants and whatnot. So they're trying to put on a show, and uh, and definitely playing up to the audience and the crowd that's here. But what I'm most looking forward to or what I'm most watching for today is this wide receiver core in the absence of the top three. And you'll hear from Ryan Tannehill on that later in the show. We're going to get into what John Ledyard of Pewter Report has been seeing out here on the practice field coming up next. Um, But certainly the Titans wide receivers in the absence of A.J. Julio and now Marcus Johnson, um, how Caleb Farley kind of responds to his first day of work out here against the Bucs. He's, he's had moments. He's had moments where he's performed admirably. He's also had moments where he's been made to look like a dude who hasn't played football in two years. And that I think is uh, that I think Lucas is something that people have, have expressed concerns about the thing that I get, that I get DM'd and tweeted about most is does Caleb Farley look like a first round pick and why the hell does Julio Jones not practice? And both of those things, I'm just kind of like, yeah, you know, tough bleep. I mean, it's probably no coincidence that Rashad Weaver has has been the most productive drafted rookie, right? Whether it's in training camp or in preseason, he was the most productive college football player out of all the drafted rookies in 2020. Well, and you have to consider the two of their draft picks, both Dylan Radens, who played one college football game in the year of the Rona 2020, and Caleb Farley, who opted out of the 2020 season, their first round pick. Those guys, you know, you're grading on a different curve. And we'll, we'll talk about Dylan Radens, uh, an analysis, a deep dive of Dylan Radens and Rashad Weaver. Um, we'll play you a little bit of the, uh, a little bit of yesterday's episode of the install with Greg Cosell of NFL films, where we deep dive and do analysis on specific players, schemes, what everybody is uh, play, play designs, things of that nature. Greg, uh, I gave Greg two players that I wanted him specifically to watch from that preseason game against Atlanta. I think you guys will really enjoy the insight that Cosell brings to the table. 615-737-1045 is how you jump in. But coming up next, John Ledyard of Pewter Report going to sit down with us at the table. Uh, he had some standout Titans players that he was most impressed with. Now, remember, John joined us when Bud Dupree uh, was signed by the Tennessee Titans. He's one of the best talent evaluators. Um, before his time with Pewter Report, he was basically – the uh, the top dog at the draft network. He he is one of the people, one of the main people who brought that thing up to the place 
where it finds itself now. It was one of the, you know, basically the Bible for people who are interested in pre-draft analysis and all these things. John has studied a lot of these dudes coming out of college and into the league, and he had some observations about not just the Buccaneers versus the Titans, but some of these Titans players as well. So we'll get into that with John Ledger of Pewter Report. Coming up next, I'm Buck Rising. This is 104.5 The Zone. J. Martin and Ramon are not afraid to put themselves out there with a bold prediction. I've been fighting saying this out loud. Who would say? I'm picking the Titans to win the Super Bowl. Tomorrow, starting at 6 on 104.5 The Zone.
Tennessee Titans and the defending Super Bowl champion Tampa Bay Buccaneers. So we had to we had to get the the other perspective. We had to do a little crosstalk with our buddy John Ledyard of Pewter Report, who sits down with us now. Buddy, what the, what the hell happened with these two teams today? Because this has been out of control. Listen, Buck, a lot of things have happened in a very short amount of time, and my neck hurts from twisting and turning and trying to tweet and take notes and <laughs> chronicle all the five fights that we've had today. Yeah. It's been uh, something else here practice between the Bucks and the Titans. Well, they ha- we had a perfect situation out here because they've just moved from one field directly in front of us to the other, so I thought we were going to be able to do live play-by-play from the, uh, from the facility, but indeed – uh, they are moving away. So what happened between Ryan Jensen and the Buck Center and Jeffrey Simmons? Because I think uh, I think that uh, I missed a couple of them just in the short time that it took me to walk over to my table over here. <laughs> yeah, that's one that everybody's kind of been had their eye on, right? I went to see when those two would get kind of go at each other. But uh, yeah, the, I think it was, it looked like to me, you know, I'm, I only get one crack at it, but it looked like Simmons was just kind of hanging on to Leonard Fournette after the play sure. and wouldn't let him get back to the huddle. And Jensen took exception, came over, got in his face and Leonard's not going to back down either. So then there was this huge scrum and both teams came together, pulled him apart after a while, got him out of there. But both those guys are pretty fiery. I think we'll probably see them go at it before the, and again before the day's over. The practices indeed have been very hotly contested. So from one-on-ones, 11-on-11, 7-on-7, what what are your primary observations that you've made between these two teams? Because the, the, the position battles have been really fun to watch so far. Yeah, it has been. I mean, I, I have spent most of my time watching the Bucks offense against Titans defense just because of the way our staff is kind of laid out around these two practices today. So I've, I've most of my observations have been in that area. And I think yesterday, you know, you saw Caleb Farley get, make a couple of plays and there's some things to be excited about his size is incredible i can't believe how big he is for a corner and he can run for sure but the technique got exposed a little bit today you know mike evans and antonio brown have cooked him up pretty good so like it's going to be a learning experience for him right that's what's going to have to happen i think for him to take that step he's going up against literally the best receiving core in the league i hear and so it's going to test him continue to push him he gets that in practice right now with well when julio jones is back uh, and when aj brown's you know those guys are out there it'll be that kind of a test in practice too so Lots of opportunities for him to continue to grow, but like as somebody who covers the draft too, he's the guy I was most excited to watch. And there's certainly been plenty of events surrounding him. There's been flashes of good, and today's been a lot of learning, I think. Yeah, well, don't 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 even say the name Julio Jones into the microphone. You're gonna piss my entire <laughs> audience off, John. They don't understand why he doesn't practice, and I keep telling people I mean, hey, this, is, pissing, this is the, them the breaks. Fox fans wanted to see him, you know. Yeah. They, I mean, they're, he's one of those players they're in awe of all the times that Julio torched him when they were in, he was in Atlanta. So they wanted to see him here against the better Bucks team, but but not going to happen, I guess. So for, because you do focus so much on the draft in your coverage of the league as a whole, and of course, being a draft network prior to this, what what kind of was your evaluation of Caleb Farley, understanding that we really haven't seen this dude play football in two years? It was it was that in a vacuum, like in a, in a two, basically he's, he's a good player. You know what I mean? Like yeah, if, yeah. You, if, if you talk about him in a linear sense, like he can run and he's big and he's long and he can turn and even make plays on the football on occasion, it's inconsistent, but the, the ability's there. And we've seen DBs, you know, Carlton Davis on the box is an example of a guy who hardly found the football and in, in the air in college, but in the NFL has done it a lot more. Yeah. Well, Farley, you are starting to see you when he played, you could start to see that in college and developing that the biggest thing for him is going to be breaking routes. You know what I mean? Like any, Anything that's in short to intermediate stuff in breakers, especially if it's an outside corner, he's got to be able to read and break on that kind of stuff mirror and match a little bit better when he's in man coverage. There's tons of ability with him. It's technique. It's learning to keep your eyes disciplined and see things the same way every time and break stuff down. I think it's just raw stuff like that, that he needs to work on. So it's going to come down to coaching and fit. I liked him coming out. I didn't necessarily love him coming out, but I liked him uh, still a good bit. I thought the range they took him in was really good. Right, was the right range for him. Yeah. So now it'll be about coaching him up and developing him. He's got a veteran in Janoris Jenkins to learn from. You know, I heard the Titans coaches talking yesterday about how much Janoris Jenkins has been just great for this team and how much he's taken young guys under the wing and just been an awesome guy in their locker room. And so that's a big positive to hear about Janoris. And so I think if that's the case and he's responding well to coaching, the future is pretty bright for Farley. Now you said that's the right range for Caleb Farley where they drafted him at 22. A lot of people thought that his stock just purely tanked because of the back issues that he was having the two procedures mm-hmm. but that was your evaluation right. based on the player that you saw correct yeah i don't really factor in injuries just be, especially a situation like his i had no idea i mean right i don't have any idea when it comes to that kind of stuff when he's going to be back if he'll ever be the same he the good news is that in practice he 
he looks it doesn't look like there's any athletic limitation in him at all it's just a, it's a technique and timing and that kind of stuff like not taking a step you know not taking a step in the wrong direction based thing and broken off on a route that kind of stuff is where he's going to really need to develop and 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 kind of enhance his game and let's just be honest the titans really need him right because oh, so bad you know what i mean like the, He's but he and Christian Fulton are like kind of the future for this secondary group. And it's a group that they're hoping takes a big step from the group they had last year. And I, and there's a lot riding on him, even if he may not play or start this year, we'll see, you know, but there's still a lot riding on him. They, they really need to get that pick, right? John Ledyard of Pewter Report is here with us on 104.5 The Zone. You can follow John at Ledyard NFL Draft on the social. So you've watched the Bucks offense against the Titans defense. I have been doing the exact same thing because you know we only get to see Tom Brady so many times. You guys get you guys get a lot more. So you know when when the bright shiny object is in front of me, John, I got to gravitate that way. But you said on Twitter that Caleb Farley, as we talked about, Jayon Brown and Lorel Murchison stood out to you. What were kind of your observations from those two specifically? Jayon Brown's just such a good coverage linebacker, and like everything else is, I don't want to say it's all totally replaceable at that position, but. When you can cover a linebacker, it just gives your defense so many more options. I mean, you know, Levante David's been basically one of the be best, if not the best in the league and his whole career at doing that. And it's allowed the Bucs just so much flexibility with what they do around him. You saw that in the Super Bowl. He could They could stay in that, you know, keep him on the field and keep two linebackers on the field the whole game. And he could cover Travis Kelsey. And it just allows you to do a lot of different things. And to me, it's just like, can his skill set kind of take the whole next step to being like a complete, dominant linebacker this year because he made a couple of plays on balls to Gronkowski yesterday and you know contrary to popular opinion Gronk can still get open and so oh, Jayon yeah. Brown's ability to stick with him is impressive to me and Murchison it's just you know he's always been explosive it's like can everything else kind of develop his hands can it develop you know first step is like the most important thing but then you know everything else was kind of coming out of college kind of needed work still I thought and so for him it's just going to be about can that the rest of his game develop you've told me some good things from Titans Raxis Teron Davenport's told me some good things I saw some good things yesterday I haven't seen him today but yeah it's encouraging stuff I mean he's a very talented player I think if he can put it all together he's going to be a guy that can help you on the defensive line and all of this is defense because God knows they need it after how just yeah. abhorrent they were on that side of the ball last year 51 percent of their third down conversions they allowed against their opponents. Laurel Murchison in, in basically what's a 5-2 defensive front. What is his natural position, or is he somebody that they can move around? Well, you would probably know that better than me. I've always thought of him as a three technique, but yeah. I'm not going to rule out his ability to move around either. It really almost in the, these days, it depends really what are you asking him to do snap to snap. You know, if you want your nose tackle to play like Vita Vea, then that's probably not the role for him. But if you want your nose tackle to one gap, you know, if you want your nose tackle to, to fire and get upfield and cross the face of the center, and then he can do some things, you know, in that role too. So there's, you might be able to use him in multiple ways. I think the, the question for guys like really all their defensive linemen right now, right? Like, they need to know if can can you give us some pass rush juice like pass rush was such a huge issue in Tennessee last year and uh, it's been a huge issue and it's they just need more from players not named Jeffrey Simmons you know they right now their group is pretty unproven in terms of an interior group and can you get to the quarterback and I would say that's probably the next question Simmons needs to answer too it's definitely gotten better in that way but that'll be where his game needs to take the next step so all of these guys you know I think if you're the Titans and you're not working pass rush like 10 times at practice, you know, you're missing out. I think they need to be just drilling moves and pass their skill and games and all that kind of stuff over and over and over again up front. This has all been very, very exceptional football conversation. I want to ask you a question. Why the hell are you not sweating? It's 100 degrees out here. Well, you're sitting I, here not sweating. I'm dying. I, I cannot give you a full explanation. Yesterday I was dying. Today I feel okay. And I, I'm a <laughs> PA boy and I moved here like eight months ago. So go figure. Maybe I'm adjusting quickly. I don't know. Uh, John Ledyard of Pewter Report here with us on 104.5 The Zone. So from, from the standpoint of the team that you cover, they return all 22 starters. Yeah. It's unthinkable. I, I It's difficult to do the projections because you obviously don't know what's going to happen over the course of the season. But from what you saw and the transition that they made throughout the course of 2020 to where they really felt like they were hitting their stride as the season wore on and into the playoffs, how much better can they get, John? They can be the best team in the league all year long if they focus and execute that way. That's really – that's been the story with them all through last year. Uh, it's rare collection of talent. Uh, I don't think older players have passed their prime yet. I mean, even guys like Ndamukong Sue, where he's passed his prime, but he's still a very good player, still has played 75% of your snaps. I mean, he's a defensive tackle that's going to be the second oldest in the league. You know, Brady's obviously still dealing, and, you know, A.B. is – doesn't look like he's lost anything. He's looked unbelievable at camp. So, I mean, there's, there's just a lot that 
I, I think everybody's kind of right in that wheelhouse to have a great seasons. You know what I mean? Like nobody, it's not like an over the hill roster. They have tons of young, exciting players. A lot of their best players are like right in their prime window. Um, so yeah, it's kind of a group that has the perfect balance across the board. All key positions, you know, are kind of proven at this point. Now the secondary still got some things to prove, but the way they played in the playoffs last year, it's going to go a long way with people, but yeah, it's going to come down a lot to how much they can execute on offense. You know, last year, 30 points a game and they're, you know, we would look at their offense and say, man, they're frustrating at times. You know, like they right. dropped the ball a lot. They're second in the league in drops and the penalties were an issue at the beginning of the season. Then they fixed that and, you know, drops were a big issue. And there were tons of routes where it seemed like guys weren't on the same page and they would go through, you know, four, three and out drives where like they couldn't even complete a pass. And then all of a sudden they three touchdowns in a row. It was just, can there be consistency and efficiency? Arian's offense is all about chunk plays. I get that. But when they accepted, we need to attack the intermediate portions of the field. We need to use play action. We need to go short. When they accepted that there were some schematic limitations to what Arian's traditional scheme put on them, they changed as a unit and they got better as a unit. Their efficiency increased as a unit. So my mind, it's about eliminating mistakes. Obviously, that kind of goes without saying, but it's also about accepting the limitations of what you've done in the past and trying to advance and change as a unit. I think when they did that last year, offensively and defensively, Todd Bowles changed what he did completely in this playoffs. It was stunning. Yeah. Uh, and it was a huge reason why teams couldn't figure them out. So if they can do that again this season, stay ahead of teams schematically, they're going to be great because their talent is elite and all across the board. But coaching, that's the onus is on them, I think, to stay ahead of everybody else schematically. Were you surprised by how many drops we saw from both teams yesterday? I would like to say yes, but I wasn't that surprised by it. I mostly saw, again, the Bucks offense, and it, it's been a theme of camp, but it's been a theme of – it was the theme of their first preseason game. They had four or five drops, and I think five drops in that game, and, you know, we're talking about like a 13% drop rate. That's bad. Like, uh, and, that, and last year in the playoffs, they had 12 drops. That's a 13% drop rate for them in the playoffs. That's a horrible number, Buck, and they won the Super Bowl. So, right. like, imagine if, you know, Chris Godwin doesn't drop five balls against Washington or, you know, every game there was something you could point to, and it kind of kept it closer than it should have been because of a key drop. Godwin, who never drops the ball again, dropped the touchdown for half of the Saints against the Saints, and – so, yeah, there's been a lot of that, and I think that that's going to be something that they have to clean up. The good news is, of their top guys, you don't see as many drops as when you get into the like the wide receiver four, five, six range. That's when you start seeing the tight end two, three, four range. So I think the top guys are still very reliable, but it's a question that they need to answer in the upcoming preseason games for sure. How many white claws is it going to take me to get Michael Kiss blacked out tonight? <laughs> Uh, a lot. <laughs> I drank with Michael Gist. It's gonna, you're gonna be there a while, I think. <laughs> Degenerate John Ledyard of Pewter Report, kind enough to give us some of his time here on 1045. The Zone, my brother, a pleasure as always. It's good to see you in person. It's been a while, absolutely, man. It's always, always a pleasure, enjoy. always fun talking ball with you. All right, we'll let you get back to work. We'll continue the conversation if you want to jump in. 615 737 1045 is the number. 615 737 1045 drops was really the story of yesterday's practice drops by the Bucks receivers and interceptions by the Titans secondary of Tom Brady, something that I was really surprised to see mostly because it's, you know, something that we've seen from this Titans defensive core throughout the course of training camp. And people are like Darrington who got absolutely ripped Lucas up and down, up and down by all of our other callers. People have no love for Darrington yesterday. I was shocked by that. There was a lot of hatred in the, in the, on the phone lines for that. Really? You were shocked by that? I mean, a Matt a Schaub comparison for Ryan Tannehill, oh. and you were shocked that that got people up in arms? No, I mean, I think people, well, people were attacking him for more than just his Ryan Tannehill is Matt Schaub opinion. I don't think that was that was the sole, uh, sole reason for their vitriol directed to him. But, you know, Darrington has been calling in, and many people have been calling in and tweeting the show and things like that about Ryan Tannehill's interceptions in camp and, and really not attributing to it because they've been, you know, trained to think otherwise as far as this Titans defense is concerned from a year ago, that this is not a playmaking defense, even though, Lucas, the thing that we cite year in and year out, or rather not year in and year out, but day in and day out since the 2020 season is for as wretched, wretched, absolutely awful as this Titans defense was a year ago, there were tops in the leagues at turnovers. They were spectacular. They they were plus, they were something like plus fifteen or plus sixteen or something like that on the season. And again, three interceptions of Brady yesterday. Four on the whole. Caleb Farley got a pick off. Of, I can't remember if it was Kyle Trask or Blaine Gabbert, but still, they are doing things. Shane Bowen and Mike Frabel are doing things to create confusion 
for the quarterbacks as to what they're actually seeing when they're trying to diagnose the coverages. It's like what I talk about with the Tennessee defense this year, what they're going to have to do, play offense on defense, sell out for the turnovers. That that was the one redeeming quality this Titans defense had last year. That won them a couple games last year. The Vikings yeah. game, a last-second turnover. The Jags game early in the year, week two. A last, and They don't win the division without those turnovers at the end of games. Yeah, no, without question. I mean, that – that is something that was the only reason that they stayed alive throughout the course. The only reason that they were able to win their division as good as the offense was, they needed defensive stops. And the only place that they could seem to find them was by creating turnovers on that side of the ball. Six, one, five, seven, three, seven, one, Oh, four, five is how you jump in six, one, five, seven, three, seven, one, Oh, four, five. Um, to that end though, what, what did, what did you make of John's analysis of Caleb Farley? So I thought that was interesting, the way that he kind of, you know, understanding that this is a player who, and he and Dylan Radins has not played football since 2019. Radins playing one game in 2020. And really, when we talked to Cosell about it yesterday on the install, he said it more looked like a scrimmage than an actual football game that North Dakota State, North Dakota State's one game of the 2020 season. So his analysis of Farley was that there are certain ways that he gets beat inside with the way that he kind of, you know, as Coach Mack talks about it, Dave McGinnis of Titans Radio, the way that a corner flips his hips is is how you kind of see how dudes are able to stay with wide receivers in transition as they're trying to make make plays on the ball and, tra- you know, from backpedaling, flip your hips, get up and go against the wide receiver. John was more technical with it than I am, but you know what I'm saying. But with these in-breaking routes, this is something that time and time again in practice against his own receiving core and now against the Buccaneers, this is something that people are starting to notice. If even I notice it, then it's, I, I think, something that's going to continue to rear its head for him once he finally gets out on a football field, you know, in a more competitive setting, a game setting, as opposed to just working through these training camp practices. It sounded like Ledyard rated him around that spot in the early twenties, despite the back injury he said, I had nothing to do with that. That had nothing to do with my analysis of him. Sounded like he rated him right where he got drafted despite all or besides all of that. Yeah, no. I mean, he said that 22 was about where he had him. And Which I is think not that what was, we heard, you know, throughout the draft process. It was, if he was healthy, he's the first corner taken. That was our conversation. Well, and, and a lot of people, you know, listen, everybody has a, a top corner that they put out on their various draft boards and, and John's, John's evaluation of these dudes is, I mean, I trust him as much as I trust anybody other than, uh, I mean, really as much as anybody other than guys like Cosell or Mel Kuyper or people who's and Todd McShay, people who make their living this way. Cause John understands the, the traits and the techniques that these dudes use in college and how they necessarily translate to the pros or how some of it doesn't translate to the pros. And it seems like he was seeing a little bit of that or some of that throughout the course of his analysis of Caleb Farley pre-draft coming out of Virginia tech. I, uh, maybe, maybe we run that, that, uh, that clip back for the people coming up next Lucas. And we'll also talk about, uh, we'll do a little college football because we haven't talked about the Vols in quite some time. And it seems unofficially that they have named a starting court. Well, they haven't named a starting quarterback. They won't tell you that they've named a starting quarterback. God forbid, you know, it's like Danny white trying to keep everything quiet and, uh, and being surprised that leaks were coming out of Knoxville during the course of his coaching search. Like the hell do you think is going to happen? This is all, this is all people care about is the Tennessee Vols nine times out of 10. And then occasionally when an NFL game's on, they'll look up and check out what's going on. So with Joe Milton potentially being the starting quarterback, we'll talk about what that means and how that fits in Josh Heupel's offense. You'll hear from the offensive coordinator of Tennessee as well. His analysis back at the start of fall camp, about Joe Milton and what they are looking for from that position. We'll talk about Caleb Farley as well. Don't forget that, uh, that we will be carrying Titans head coach Mike Frabel's press conference. We're going to try to carry it again. Lucas, you think, you think we're going to be able to pull that off? I think we're doing good today. We haven't had ro- Have we had robot voice during the show? No, we have not. I only, only had it a little bit when we were trying to test the connection early on, but smooth sailing so far, and that right there is the kiss of death. <laughs> that's where it all goes downhill so we will attempt to carry mike frable's press conference they have poor mike in front of like a bunch of hedges out here like on the side of the field brady's in the air-conditioned tent bruce arians in the air-conditioned tent mike's out there with it in front of a like the sad little like titans xfinity backdrop uh next to some hedges on the side of the practice field so we will see how their wi-fi connection is because our seems to be doing much better today we'll come back and talk falls I'm Buck Rising. This is 104.5 The Zone presented by Scoreboard Bar and Grill. 
The Titans are in Tampa against the Super Bowl champion Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Yeah, it's the preseason, but hey, it's Tom Brady. Mike Keith and Coach Mack have the kickoff Saturday night at 6.30. Throws a man down ah. and goes out of bounds at the 40. Ah. On your home for Titans football and flagship for Titans Radio, 104.5 The Zone.
<laughs> food, music, sports, the world's largest selection of bushwhackers. Go check them out. Is the weather as is the weather is? I mean, it's beautiful out here in Tampa. My, my backdrop, Lucas, on Zone TV looks so much better, as you pointed out. It looked like I was in a kill scene yesterday with that uh, that white, like I don't even know how to describe it, just white sheet plastic that looked like I was getting ready to commit a murder of somebody. Who, what did somebody say? Dexter. Dexter. Dexter's like? kill room. You said you had never seen Dexter. Uh, I have seen Dexter, and it was very accurate. I've never seen Dexter. I've seen American Psycho, where he's, you know, yeah, asking the dude, mm-hmm. you like Huey Lewis in the news? And then he <laughs> just sticks him in the head with an axe. That's what I was doing yesterday, except instead of an axe, it was a microphone. And instead of killing somebody, I was ruining Tom Brady's press conference. So we've come a long <laughs> way over the course of the last 24 hours. 615-737-1045. If you want to jump in, get back to the Titans conversation here in just a second. Uh, but I want to I want to pivot and talk about the balls because there's been like legitimate developments. It sounds like over there in Knoxville about the starting quarterback. The conversation has been really outside of the coach, the change, uh, the change in coaching staff, the NCAA violations, whether Jeremy uh, Pruitt was giving uh, people money and McDonald's bags and all of these things allegedly that got him fired for cause. Outside of that, it's been which of these four quarterbacks is going to end up starting for the really balls in 2021. Point, really three at this point. What are you taking? Are you taking Maurer out the mix? Maurer has not appeared, made an appearance at practice since he initially did not appear about a week ago. The staff continues to say there's no update there, but uh, at this point, there's no reason for us to think he's in the mix. So when they say no update there, they're just like, yeah, he's just not out here. Like, how do they, do they not have to give? I mean, I guess it's not like the pros where they have to give an injury. Report. Right. No, that's basically been it. They said they had a conversation with him. They've talked about limiting his reps in practice, which tells you one thing right there. And he hasn't been at practice since then. He hasn't officially entered the transfer portal, but every time they're asked, there's no update on Brian Maurer. He's still on this roster. He's just not at practice, but kind of read between the lines a little bit. It doesn't look like Brian Maurer really factors in here. Yeah, indeed. So Brian Maurer out the mix. So let's talk about these three quarterbacks. By the way, the joint training camp practices have just concluded, it seems, for the day. Both teams are gathered at midfield and not fighting one another. So I think that <laughs> good, is a good. I think that is a critical a critical observation to point out. Um, but what sticking with the Vols, and we'll get back to the Titans and Bucks observations here in just a second. Mike Vrabel's press conference as well, or our best effort at Mike Vrabel's press conference. We'll roll the dice and see what the internet has for us. Um, Alex Golish, who is the offensive coordinator for Tennessee, he was talking before fall camp about, about what they are looking for in a quarterback in this offense. Because, of course, offense is going to think be the thing that people are hyper-focused on this year. This was the Vols OC, Alex Golish, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, traits from the quarterback, the ability to, to run, manage the offense, be really, really efficient, give us the best opportunity to score. Um, I know that's, that's a little bit cliche in a lot of ways, um, but you got to be able to operate within the system. That is Alex Golish. So you have to be able to operate within the system. And then he was asked about Joe Milton specifically. And he gave what, you know, as Lucas described it, I haven't yet heard this audio, but as Lucas described it, a overwhelmingly glowing response. Really strong arm guy, big body type. Uh, I mean, big, big body. He is big. He is as big of a quarterback as I've ever been around. Um, Strong, really strong arm. Um, Has the ability to run. They, they did not ask him to do that just a ton, uh, but but can win running the football with him as well. Um, but extremely strong arm. Since he's been here, you, you kind of look at the film, you realize he's a really highly intelligent, um, fun guy to be around, loves football. All those things that we preach in recruiting, all those things that, that we internally constantly talk about, guys that are mentally tough, guys that are intelligent, guys that share a love for the game of football. Those are the guys we want in our program. He fits that. I'm going to go back to what I said earlier. We've not gone through any adversity with Joe. Joe had gone through adversity at Michigan. Um, obviously, ups and downs in his career season there a year ago. We've not gone through any of that with Joe. We've not gone through any of that in a lot of ways with a lot of guys. That will be the true tell of what Joe is. I'm excited to see it. He's excited to show us. He's excited to show himself his family like that that he can take the next step um as a passer as a runner as a quarterback as a guy that can lead lead a big time college football program 
to where it should be. Um, now, we'll find out. Uh, I'm excited to find out. I think we're all excited to find out because he's the only one out of, out of those guys that we have not seen in person, live, in this system, in this offense. Uh, I'm excited. I'll have a way better idea in a week, week and a half, and, and we'll find out. That's Vols OC Alex Golish talking about Joe Milton, who is not, you know, has not yet been confirmed as the starting quarterback for the University of Tennessee. Lucas, that was damn near romantic in talking know, about right? Joe Milton. <laughs> what was that? And you didn't hear that tone when he talks about any other quarterbacks. To be fair, the majority of questions in the lead into training camp were more centered around Joe Milton because that's the guy they brought in. That's the one guy they didn't get to see during spring practice. But yeah, yeah, you talk about a glowing review, you know. To me, that sounds like a guy that wants him to win the quarterback job. I, it would seem so. I mean, and listen, they they brought him in from the transfer portal for a reason. So clearly, they saw something in him, despite all of our uh, all of the jokes that I've made at Joe Milton's expense about what he was at Michigan. Which, of course, as I have reiterated, trying to be kind to a college football player who is not, you know, a full grown adult, not a paid professional yet unless he gets balls NIL money. And then, you know, maybe we can be a little more critical of college athletes because they are actually being paid for the first time. Finally, and importantly, oh, I'm watching. It's out. Mike Vrabel's already at the podium. People are like straight up sprinting across the field. It's hilarious to watch people scurrying for three fields away. I don't think they're going to make it. Vrabel's going to already be back on the bus. But, um, yes, Joe Milton in this offense, mobility and size certainly is something that he has, but the accuracy is, is still something I question. Now you can find ways of course, to mitigate accuracy in college football, the way that offense is manufactured and the play designs. And, you know, depending on, depending on what your personnel is and, and what your varying level of uh, prototypical quarterback traits that you have is you can find ways to get around things like that. I just, from an execution standpoint, because you, you still have to be able to execute. If your accuracy is not there, you still have to find ways to be able to execute what you're being asked to do. That doesn't change. So from an execution standpoint, when I go back and when I go back and watch Joe Milton, that was not something that necessarily popped off the screen, but Jeffrey Simmons is live at the podium right now, apparently. So I think that we, Lucas, if, are, are we prepared to go to that live? You got to speak a little louder if you're talking into my ear. <laughs> I can't. Not, not up yet. Okay. So we will, uh, we will wait for Jeffrey Simmons. Um, and we will see what number 98 has to say live from the practice facility, but, uh, the, the execution is something that continues to be a concern with him. I, I mean, does that make you feel better, Lucas, as somebody who cares about the university of Tennessee, the way that you do, I'm not going to paint you as a homer right now, but like <laughs> from a standpoint, from a standpoint of, okay, three quarterback, four, five quarterbacks, down to four quarterbacks, down to three quarterbacks. And now it seems like you found one. Is that the best of the options that's available to you? At this point, I think it looks like it is. Uh, and the tell in there with Alex Golish was when he talked about the traits between the quarterback, the first thing he said was the ability to run. When he talked about Joe Milton, he said, you can win games running the football with him. That's not the be-all, end-all in this offense. They don't run the quarterback very often. But athleticism, mobility, the ability to throw on the run when you're cutting the field in half, I think is important to this staff. And Harrison Bailey doesn't quite bring that. Hendon Hooker maybe does a little bit. But just hearing, kind of linking those two together when he talked about traits in a quarterback, what they want, and then the glowing review about Joe Milton. Right now, all signs point to Joe Milton being the starting quarterback on Thursday night, September 2nd, against Bowling Green. Indeed. I am, uh, I'm interested to see what this season for the balls look like. I, I, I started out, I started out very, very pessimistic. You know, I just try to keep my expectations relative from all the things that we've seen and all the, and, and I haven't lived down in Nashville for that long. I mean, it's been going on into, into six years and I, but in that time period, like Butch Jones had some good years. The Vols in the first year, Jeremy Pruitt, the way that you started to see things kind of cycle up for them after the dreadful start, the uh, the loss against, oh, it was a Georgia State, the first loss of the year at Neyland Stadium. The 2019, most yeah. Oh, my God. And so the way that they kind of rebounded after that, okay, you saw some promise. You saw the team make themselves bowl eligible, go out and win a bowl game, even if, you know, it was more Indiana losing that bowl game than it was. Tennessee straight up winning it because of course JG has his had his struggles still bitter there huh? as well 
To still what? Still bitter, huh? I'm still bitter? Hell yeah, I'm still bitter. Are you kidding me? I, who, who wants to look like a penis for three months because you <laughs> lost a bet and just got your head shaved? If I did that to you, what would you look like? What would you I look would like, look, Big Ed? I would look so dumb. Yeah, right. We should maybe maybe we'll try that. Maybe maybe we'll maybe we'll do that during the season. Who ends up with a better record, Tennessee or Indiana, in the year of the Rona twenty twenty? I don't want to do that. I do not. You don't want to do that. You nope. don't. You don't feel confident about your boys. Nope. Yeah. I like Tom Allen and, and I, I like Josh Heupel, but nope, not ready to make that leap. I know a lot of alls like Tom Allen. They were trying to hire my guy Tom Allen away, but nonetheless, he remains there in Bloomington, Indiana. But yeah, I, I, you know, I feel the, the, until I see the product on the field, like I have nothing to judge right now from how good or how bad the balls are going to be. Right. Just understanding all the circumstances that are working against them and how much of that has made, you know, their lives perpetually difficult for the better part of the past decade, be it, you know, one kind of adversity or another. But until, until I, until I see the offense, and kind of understand what it is they're going to be working with this season. I'll, I'll reserve my judgments for them, good or bad. We will come back, start the second hour. We'll hear from Titans at the podium as well. This is 104.5 The Zone presented by Scoreboard Bar and Grill. Coming up today on Blaine and Mickey. Amy Wells, a.k.a. Titans Amy. That's how you know her of the Titans radio crew. Will join us to fill us in after the latest Titans-Bucks joint practice. And we'll make our weekly visit with Coach Doug Matthews as the Josh Heupel era draws closer or to an end. Today, starting at 1 p.m. on 104.5 The Zone.
Tampa Bay Buccaneers. We are pleased to be out here. Beautiful weather in scenic, sunny Tampa Bay. There's even a breeze, Lucas, so I can't even complain about how hot I am. This is this is the back sweat capital of the world, by the way. But there's time there's time to talk about that at greater length later. In the meantime, let's go to Titans head coach Mike Vrabel. This isn't like we alternate days. It's just you want to come out every day and compete, um, make adjustments. Okay, apparently Mike Mike Vrabel froze. They've run the two players just fine, but Vrabel at the podium is just frozen. So, uh, so that that Zoom link or that uh, that feed has apparently gone down. So we will see what the Titans head coach had to say later on in in the uh, in the show 615-737-1045 if you would like to jump in on the conversation 615-737-1045 a lot of uh, a lot of good work gotten out here for a lot of dudes who need it frankly i'm not concerned about julio jones i'm not concerned about aj brown derrick henry or any of the stars that we did not see although we did see derrick henry to a uh, you know in a staggered degree over the course of this, it wasn't him going through the 11 on 11 drills. It was Jeremy McNichols in the absence of Darrington Evans, Brian Hill getting some work as well. But those are the guys who need it. Those are the guys on this roster who are trying to make this roster who the preseason is designed for. Ultimately, that's what you're looking for as you're trying to determine the top 53. So now Lucas tells me we've got Mike Vrabel at the podium again. Let's roll the dice and give it another shot. Go ahead, Lucas. We'll look at it, and uh, we'll, we'll see the guys that competed and see the guys that you know, didn't perform or, or whatever and try to find out what the reason is. But um, consider. All right. Lucas, Lucas said enough of that. How frustrated are you? God love you. You're trying so hard back there. You're, <laughs> you're all alone. It's fine. You're in the I'm production fine. studio. It's fine. I'm fine. I mean, listen, if we if we couldn't have uh, NPR radio today, we had to have some kind of technical difficulties. I don't even think I even think it's on our end, though, Lucas. I think that's on. The, I mean, they're they're literally out by a bunch of bushes like yeah. on the side of the facility. There's no way they've got a good Wi-Fi connection to be streaming this. Um, now, Kaharski has just tweeted something from Mike Vrabel. Can we pull up that tweet? Because I'd like to play this audio if possible, because Mike Vrabel said he thought, uh, oh, Mike Vrabel said he thought today sucked from the players. So I'd like to play this audio. Okay. So Lucas is taping it, but let's pull up the tweet, Lucas, if we can, and run that audio uh, from PK, who's tweeted that out. I want to make sure. Um, okay. Well, we, I honestly, Lucas, though, because he's telling me in my ear, I'm trying to give the audience the full context because Lucas talks to me in my ear in the way that you guys can't hear. I, I would rather have this tweet than the rest of the press conference. Like, I don't really care about the full scope of the press conference. I know you're trying to make it work, but this, I want to hear what he had to say about he thought today sucked because I'm certain it has something to do with the, uh, the amount of fights that were had out on the field. Discipline, you know, I saw Vrabel barking at a lot of dudes about wasted reps and things of that nature. Uh, it's not, you know, that's not what you come down here to do. You come down here to, you come down here to get better from top to bottom. And more than anything, I want to understand why exactly he thought today sucked. So we'll get that audio for you here in just a second. And then we will, uh, we will see what else Mike Vrabel had to say from the podium. Uh, you will also hear later on in the show from Greg Cosell of NFL films, who did a deep dive with me on our podcast, the install yesterday, which we also did live from this Buccaneers practice facility uh, about Dylan Radens and Rashad Weaver, two players who you guys are hyper focused on right now, trying to find, trying to find where exactly they fit within the within the makeup of this team. Because I think people got very very excited about the fifth round pick. But first, let's hear from Mike Vrabel, Saudi courtesy courtesy of Paul Kaharski about why today sucked. This isn't like the alternate days. It's just you want to come out every day and compete and make adjustments and the same guys going against the same guys. I'm sure there were some good things, but just not enough. You know, positive, just not getting in the flow of drives offensively. I don't think it was really good this, either. The scrums have a bearing on that? No, I mean, I, I, I don't know. Our job is to, to perform a football play. 
you know, regardless of whether there's sidebars or altercations, and you know, I get it, it's hot out there, guys are competing and trying to finish. Those things come up. So that's that's Mike Vrabel talking about the things that went wrong today. So he said it wasn't because of he said it wasn't because of the uh, the scrums and the uh, the dust ups. He said it's because of their job, you know, trying to formulate football plays. He was clearly dissatisfied from the performance that they had out here on the practice field against his former teammate Tom Brady. Six one five seven three seven one zero four five is how you jump in on the conversation. Six one five seven three seven one zero four five. Let's go to Harrison who has been waiting patiently on the phone lines. If you want to weigh in today, you are welcome to do so. What's up, Harrison? Hey, I called in yesterday. I don't know if you remember me um, talking about your face. Um, I got a couple of questions. I need some advice on. Um, so I'm going to an engagement party this weekend. It's supposed to be kind of casual. What do you think I should wear? And do I need to bring a present? <laughs> Lucas, what do you want me to do with that? I tell him <laughs> I, I'm out here trying to have, have serious discourse about why the Titans suck today in George training camp practice. You think Harris is just going to call every day and derail the show. Is uh, that, is that, I mean, I can prevent that from happening, but, uh, but I mean, you know, he, he, he called, he asked you a question. I feel like you kind of have an obligation to answer the question. Oh, do you as the, as the executive producer of this show, you think that I have an obligation to answer engagement questions in the middle, of super self-serious football talk. Yeah. I mean, what do you think you should wear? <laughs> uh, an engagement. I don't think I've ever been to an engagement party. I have no idea. What, what, what does one wear to an engagement party? I don't know. I mean, I would say, you know, like, is business casual too much? Like, I don't know. I mean, don't just don't look like a slob. Don't wear like shorts and a T-shirt. Wear something nice. Wear, wear pants. Wear nice shoes. Like, you know, act like you're going to see somebody, you know, Harrison, and bring, bring is what a I would present you. and bring a present bring a present uh, i don't know how i mean you're gonna get a present of the wedding you gotta have a present of the engagement party too yeah that's a good like point. how how close are you with these people i think is is the more important point like if you are if these are you know dear friends and loved ones that you value and you want to make sure that you know or they know how much you value them then yeah you bring a present to that kind of thing but i think more than anything you uh yeah just don't be a scrub that's all you got to do. Harrison, five, seven, three, seven, one, oh, four, five. Just bring a toaster and stop calling us with dumb questions. A toaster. <laughs> oh, so now you're tired of the questions. You who say I have an obligation to answer the questions. Now you're tired of it. Well, the question's already been asked, so you got to answer it, but quit, quit <laughs> asking us dumb questions. I don't... <laughs> Why don't you ask Lucas the dumb questions? You don't have enough to do back there. Lucas having a full on conversation about engagement party etiquette. Uh, whilst doing, you know, whilst trying to balance all of the things that make this live radio show uh, go on. But I guess I want to know from a football standpoint, what what were you looking for out of this week? Because what Mike Otto says, because now I have access to the uh, to some of the zone TV chat, at least I've got access to YouTube. I'm not as concerned about the starters missing. Last year showed us that the starters are pretty much able to pick it up once the season starts. So, I mean, to that end, you know, Cosell and I have talked about this before with how like things change for the Titans offense and how much, how much worse Ryan Tannehill looked on third and six, Ryan Tannehill in the offense looked on third and six without Taylor Lewan as the season wore on. Um, but I, I do think that there's, I do think that there's, um, I do think that there's something to that about, you know, for guys, for guys who are, veterans in this league the rookies it's it's critical of course and for new guys free agents who you're trying to get you know comfortable in your system except for julio jones apparently but i, I you know i'm not concerned i just i can't get myself to care about the julio jones things mostly because i've been saying this for two months that julio jones doesn't practice so don't worry about it 615-737-1045 moose on uh wants to ask a question oh is he is he on the phones or is he on twitter lucas Okay, what do you got for me from Moose on Twitter? Moose wants to know why the Super Bowl champion Buccaneer wide receivers are practicing, but A.J. Brown and Julio Jones are not. You know, it sounds like A.J. gets to do the Julio thing a little bit, doesn't it? And I'm kind of surprised by that. In fact, I want to talk about what's going on with A.J. Brown coming up next because something, something here doesn't smell – I mean, not physically here in Tampa, but something in the last couple of weeks – with the Titan stud wide receiver, especially after the way that he was going hard throughout the early part of camp and 
uh, what what he was what he was able to do after returning to the field. No OTAs, no voluntary work, all these things. Rehabilitation being the primary focus. I want to talk about what's going on with AJ Brown coming up next because it's been some time since we've seen him in action. Your phone calls as well, 615-737-1045. If you want to jump in and react to what is happening, why, why, why are the Tampa Bay Buccaneers? They're the defending Super Bowl champions practicing en masse, and the Titans aren't putting their dudes out there. We'll talk about it coming up next. I'm Buck Rising. This is 104.5 The Zone live from Tampa Bay, presented by Scoreboard Bar and Grill. The Titans play four preseason quarters against Tom Brady's Super Bowl champion Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And your flagship for Titans Radio has the game. Come back, foil! Saturday night at 6.30 on your home for Titans football. 104.5 The Zone.
more than anything, I'm I'm surprised by what I saw. Now, some of the stuff was good work, good opportunities for dudes who need the opportunity to make an impression on this coaching staff, on the front office, certainly, as they try to find their way on the 53-man regular season roster. But I was surprised by how few dudes actually got work in for the Titans among the starters. And, you know, it's not like they're going to – it's not like if they weren't out here – doing the practices with the first team bucks as because they certainly didn't have a problem getting everybody out on the field, Brady, Chris Godwin, Mike Evans, Rob Gronkowski, who's, you know, basically at this point in his career needs WD 40 to make sure that he's up and running. Like make this make sense to me. 615-737-1045. I understand caution and I understand health being the utmost priority health to the regular season, getting these guys ready for the games that matter. Nobody cares, of course, about preseason uh, and and preseason joint practices and how much you see from dudes because you guys aren't out here to watch it. You don't care. It doesn't count for win-loss margins, all of these things, of course. But if, if Tampa Bay, who's just coming off a championship and who boasts the greatest quarterback in the history of man and the probably the most talented group of skill position players, all varying uh, varying ages from Gronk to AB to Chris uh, Chris Godwin to Mike Evans, Scotty Miller, all these guys out here doing work. And Dominican Sue, the second oldest defensive lineman in the league. These guys are out on the field trying to get these reps in against a team that they probably feel like they can get better against. So what's different for what's different for the Titans? Maybe this is this is a Vrabel and Robinson priority that they want to make sure that anything that's lingering, anything that's nagging is kept in check, but I do understand complaints from fans about Julio Jones and why he's not out on the practice field, even as I've told you for two months that he doesn't practice, so don't anticipate him practicing. If you want to weigh in, 615-737-1045. Now, the Titans' defense did get some good work in over the course of the last couple of days against Tom Brady because that was one of the things that I was most focused on. You know, how does Brady operate against this defense that we know had communication issues, that we know struggled on a great many levels? Pass rush is not designed here to get home. They're not knocking down Tom Brady. They're not really making – I mean, they are making an effort to get a good rep against the offensive line in front of them if you're talking about Jeffrey Simmons or Bud Dupree or Tier Tart, Lorel Murchison, all these guys who are working up front, but they're not – taking down Brady. So if anything, Brady should have the ability to make more plays against this Titan secondary. And certainly it went I, today. I'm not sure how many, if any interceptions he threw, but yesterday he had three picks. He was picked off three different times by, uh, by Molden, by Fulton and by Jack rabbit Jenkins. And Tom Brady talked about what it's like to go up against this defense right now. And what makes this defense particularly difficult to kind of dissect in his media availability yesterday? Uh, they're good. They're challenging. They obviously are very good fundamentals. You know, they play to their help all the time. Very stout in the run game. Um, they try to confuse you uh, in the secondary, which they did a good job of that today a few times. So uh, obviously one of, the, one of the better defenses always in the league and um, a lot of good players. So it was good work for us. I mean, obviously it wasn't our uh, last time I talked to you guys. I don't think we had a great day either. So. I'm not saying, but they're good. They got a, they got a lot of good players, you know, and it's a good scheme. So they keep things moving. They blitz. They play coverage. They have some good disguises. They do a good defenses too. They challenge you to think, and um, you know, we got to be much more on top of things tomorrow. And you know, it seems like they were a little more on top of things today. Brady speaking to the media yesterday um, and talking about the work that he got against that Titans defense and the interceptions that he was throwing. 615-737-1045 is how you jump in on the conversation. I, I just, I, I understand as I've laid out why they are being cautious, why the Titans are being cautious with everything, with all of the players that are on their roster, guys who are up there in age, guys who they've brought in to make sure that they make a push and have pushed their chips all in with the trade of Julio Jones, with the signing of Bud Dupree, with the contracts, on their roster the way that they currently are. Ryan Tannehill, Derrick Henry, A.J. Brown still on a rookie deal, Jeff Simmons as well. A lot of dudes getting ready to make real NFL money, second contract money, Harold Landry, Nate Davis. But a lot of these dudes, Ben Jones and Nate Davis, by the way, haven't done a lot of work either. 
It's a curiosity as to why they are being so cautious. It almost seems like to the detriment of dudes who could have the opportunity to get meaningful reps against a team like Tampa Bay. 615-737-1045. Let's go to Bradley in Nashville who has a question about this this week and this coming up game against the Buccaneers. What's up, Bradley? How you doing? I just got to work. Um, I, I'm from up north. I, um, I've been a Pats fan most of my life. I moved down here um, around 2016, 2017. Um, but since I got down here, I've, been a, I've become a huge Titans fan because I love the fan base and I love what they're doing. Um, do you think they really have a shot? Um, I, I, maybe you already talked about this before I, I just turned on the radio. Um, I know Tannehill's taller than me, but do you think they have a shot? Did he say, thank you for the call, Bradley, 615-737-1045. He said, did, did, did he say he think he knows Tannehill's taller than him? What does that mean? What the hell am I supposed to don't know? And listen, Lucas, you can't shake your head. I, I got an audio thing. medium. What are you doing? <laughs> What are you going to do is, is basically all I got from you there. Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, the question being, do, do I think the Titans have a shot just like generally, like as a, as a Super Bowl contender is to, to win the division, I guess I would ask for a little more clarity on that question, but yeah, I mean, of course they do. Of course I think they do. Of course they think they do. You should think they do. They, they just won the division and by all accounts, you know, we, we it remains to be seen on the offensive side of the ball. If they are able to, supersede if not meet the heights that they were at a year ago it's it's not an easy thing to score 30 points a game in the nfl even though you know the other team that they were practicing against this year also scored 30 points per game and you got teams like the chiefs and the ravens putting up numbers all over the place both statistically and in and in the uh and in the box score but i mean do i think they have a shot yeah this is a team that just won the afc south last year and went a step further into how to try and make sure that the things that failed them against the Ravens, which by the way, ironically enough was offense and not defense, given how putrid their defense was a year ago. Yeah, of course they do. This is this, especially which with what's, I mean, Rome is burning around them. You know what I'm saying? We, we, we talked yesterday and Dan lust the uh, sports entertainment lawyer is going to join us tomorrow to talk about this Deshaun Watson thing. Deshaun Watson is getting investigated by the damn FBI, much less, you know, what he's going to look like with a bad Houston Texans roster. You fear to Rod Taylor because you shouldn't punctured lung or not formerly from the chargers. Uh, Carson Wentz, I almost said Andrew Luck. Carson Wentz is dealing with foot injuries and God knows what's going on in his headspace. I, I, and then there's the Jags who, if they make a substantial improvement, yeah, they'll win six or seven games, maybe at, at the height of this thing, but it's not like offense was even their biggest problem last year. Their defense sucked out loud. I don't know how, how much attention people are paying to the rest of the AFC South over the course of this, but the Jags greatest failing was not Gardner Minshew or, I mean, Mike Glenn, Mike Glennon stinks. Um, So Mike Glennon was, was not a sustainable option, but their, their offense was tolerable. It was palatable. It's the defense that really put them in the hole that they were in to where they couldn't stop anybody. And Gardner Minshew and, uh, and the, the, the rookie undrafted free agent from a year ago, the running back, whose name escapes me, uh, I believe James Robinson. Um, he could only do so much. 615-737-1045. Graham is in Nashville. He wants to talk about the Titans veteran DBs. What's up, Graham? Hey, I got a couple questions for you. I was just kind of wondering what you think Janoris Jenkins impact will be to this team and how you feel about, um, guys like Kevin Byard maybe not getting meaningful snaps in the preseason. And just to leave you with something, I also think Tannehill is taller than me as well. Yeah, what? What is that, Graham? Help me. I mean, listen, I we love all of our callers. We love all of our audience. But, like, I, I don't understand the analysis. Yeah, I think Tannehill's taller than me. Well, what the hell do I care if Tannehill's taller than you? What? <laughs> this is yeah it's lucas it's it's like it's like our zone tv chat sometimes where the entirety of the zone tv chat is just talking about how much pot they're smoking during the day because i don't know if these guys have like if they're just chilling like in the chat they're just smoking pot and watching the show on on youtube like chilling in the house or something like that or like they're college kids 
or whatever. But like our entire zone TV chat just evolves into like different kinds of smoking methods that people are doing. So maybe that's what the guy, what, you know, the occasional caller who gets a uh, occasional call, but he just said he got the work. So I don't know. Anyway, let me take Graham's questions first and foremost. Janoris Jenkins impact on this team is, I mean, honestly, Kevin Byard is a critical piece. Amani Hooker, who made some nice plays out here today, a couple of a uh, couple of pass breakups. I saw one over Gronk and the other over Antonio Brown. Um, when he wasn't even the defender in coverage, he came over as the help safety to make a play. Uh, really, a leaping pass breakup over Antonio Brown, and the Gronk one was just a he was just in the right spot. He undercut the route um, before the pass could get there in a way that makes you feel good about your starting safety tandem not much of a drop off and in fact an athletic improvement over Kenny Vaccaro from a year ago for as good of uh as for as good of a of role as Kenny played during his couple of years here in Nashville but Janoris Jenkins I believe to be the most important piece of the secondary I really do even at 32 years old for what they're asking him to do for the deficiencies that were in the secondary last year why they play seven or eight yards off a year ago because they're afraid to get beat over the top and not play in press man. Well, instead, they brought in a whole new secondary, for the most part, that specializes and that has the skill set to be able to play a ton more press man coverage to disrupt the receivers at the line of scrimmage. Jack Rabbit, when you watch him on film, there is not that is not a 32 year old. The install with Greg Cosell gives you an inside look into the film life of senior producer for NFL films and NFL matchup, Greg Cosell. The install with Greg Cosell, joined by Buck Rising, every Wednesday afternoon at 6. Download now at Apple Podcast, Spotify, and wherever you get your podcast. This is for the men who never settle, the ones who miss the fairway all day and still pull out the big stick. The type of guys who will always prefer to be behind the grill than in front of the camera. And the men who never let their friends forget about a high school nickname. This is the Lodge mentality. This is Twin Peaks. Who wants to settle for a single TV? With more TVs, bigger screens, plus our fabulous scenic views, there's more to watch at Twin Peaks. So then I dropped some garlic and croutons on there and the rest is salad history. I made the best salad ever, people. And now I'm making the best app. The Caesar Sportsbook app got live in-game betting, parlays, and Caesar rewards. Caesar salad ain't got nothing on my app. Nothing. Must be. scramble about try people are sprinting in and out of the studio to make sure that i'm not the one who did something wrong but you know with technology it's okay we're back on the air and we're making sure this thing is free flowing and functioning but we were talking about janoris jenkins and i believe him to be the most important part of the titan secondary truly for the education that he's able to pass down to the players who are new in this to the players who are still trying to find their way through This, you know, this new look, I mean, it's not a new look defense, but it's a new look personnel group. It's something that on the whole, Christian Fulton has to find ways to work with these new guys, even though he's going into the second year and you would assume that there is some kind of continuity that's being carried over. He understands better the concepts that they want to run. He understands 
the kind of the kind of defense that the that that it that this is. He understands how much better these guys can be. But as far as Janoris Jenkins is concerned, yeah, if if anything happens to him early in the season, I think this thing has a real potential to fall apart because it's fascinating to watch him out on the field kind of coordinating things outside of what Anthony Midget and Scott Booker are coaching the players up on the cornerbacks and safeties coach respectively. He's a critical part of the development of guys like Elijah Molden and Caleb Farley and how to make everything work. 615-737-1045. Let's go to Kenneth in Smyrna who wants to weigh in. What's up, Kenneth? Boss man, I Kyle, excuse you, I want you to uh, explain to me, you know, we keep talking about the Titans winning the AFC South, which is important. You got to win your division, okay. But we never compare them to the heavy hitters in the AFC as a whole because that's how we get to the championship. You got to win the AFC as a whole. So how do you think they'll fare up against Buffalo? How do you think they'll fare up against Kansas City? You see what I'm saying? Oh, no, for sure. Like, I guess I guess the, the context that I take, and I appreciate the call, Ken, it's 615-737-1045. Like, the, the question was, you know, do they have a shot? And for me – do they have a shot means do they have a shot to get in the playoffs? Cause once they're in the playoffs, then, then it's anybody's it's anybody's guess. Yes. You have varying degrees of good or bad teams that make the playoffs, especially with the postseason expanded and an additional, uh, and an additional wildcard team based off of last year's structure, but how they stack up again. So you're, you're chasing, you're chasing can you're chasing Kansas city and Buffalo perpetually. That's what Julio Jones is about. That's what Bud Dupree is about. That's what that's what the contract extensions for Derrick Henry and Ryan Tannehill are about. They are right on the precipice of this. If they get the defense, listen, nobody's Patrick Mahomes, but you can compete with Josh Allen and the Buffalo Bills, whose offense took a gigantic leap forward last year. How much better they can be? You know, that remains that remains a point of discussion. But as far as as far as how they stack up in the AFC with the other teams, they are. If their defense finds its way, you know, from 29th overall to 20th and they keep pace on the offensive side of the football, they're just as good as Buffalo. They have all of the ability, if not more than the Buffalo Bills. Everybody, everybody in the league is chasing Kansas City. Even the team that we watch the Titans have joint practices out here against (laughs) Everybody, Tom Brady included, is trying to keep pace with Kansas City. The only reason that Patrick Mahomes and Andy Reid got got last year is because every offensive lineman under the sun apparently got hurt. And even still, Mahomes is making throws where he's basically horizontal lying down, launching a ball off a platform that he should never be making a throw off of, hitting a dude in the numbers, and then the guy just drops it in the end zone. So, I mean, Kansas City is is above and beyond. That's what the Patriots have been for 20 years with Brady. How do you keep pace? Now that mantle has been passed down from Brady to Mahomes. It just so happens, unfortunately, for the Titans that both those teams win the AFC. 615-737-1045. Let's go to Zach from Oak Grove, Kentucky. Wants to take a shot. Listen, I love when the callers feud amongst one another. I want to turn this into a Paul Feinbaum type environment. So let's see what Zach's got to say. What's up, Zach? What's going on, there, Mr. Bug, man? Man, we're living just oh, fine no. down here in Tampa Bay. Oh, yeah, yeah. It ain't just Kentucky weather, I'll tell you that much. Don't worry about no tornadoes or nothing. Anyway, <laughs> Head on man. a swivel. Yes, sir. So um, I, I, I've been listening to your show here recently, and, and I keep hearing this guy that keeps calling in talking about Ryan Tannehill is Matt Shabish and, and all this guard. So I decided to take matters into my own hand, and I hit him up and I messaged him, and I tried to see if we can have a come-to-Jesus meeting. And I have to tell you, Buck, uh, after he got to talking for a while, he, he doesn't make any sense. <laughs> but to a degree, I kind of understood the, or the premises of where he was going. Do okay. I agree he's a match shop? No. But I understand why all these major NFL shows and ESPNs and all that stuff, because they consider Tennessee to be a running team, and that's their bread and butter. And, and how Nate Burleson said Derrick Henry would change the game. They don't talk about Rand Tannehill like that. And I believe that one can't go without the other. So I think after me and him discussing and talking that we can't, we, we, we realize that Ryan Tannehill is probably a 15 through 20 type quarterback. He's good. He's good. He's not great. He's good. Yeah. Uh, and and we, we, what we end up leaving off on was that running back. And he does not like to be calling him his name. I don't want to say it because I can't say it right. 
but he was old. He gave me an earful about him, Buck. So my thing, I got a question for you. How do you see Ryan Tannehill? Is he top tier, or is he just a bridge gapper for the next great? Okay. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. And I know we've got, I know we've got people calling in. I want to keep, I want to continue to take your guys's reaction and I'll address the question that he's just posed to me coming up next. We appreciate the call 615-737-1045. I'll tell you exactly how I view Ryan Tannehill coming up next. It's 104.5 The Zone live from Tampa Bay for the Titans joint training camp practices against the Buccaneers presented by Scoreboard Bar and Grill. 15 years in the making and worth the wait. A highly anticipated lakefront resort, golf, and marina community is releasing new property never before available to the public. One day only. It's Saturday, August 21st. Experience lake living at a fraction of the price with lake lots with covered boat slips from $49.9, 20 grand off lakefront villas, private golf cart access to a new marina and resort, 10 miles of walking trails, three and a half miles of shoreline you can play on the lake or simply relax at the waterfront restaurant just over 20 minutes away from knoxville they've got financing available at these recently historically low interest rates call to secure your private priority tour appointment times are limited enjoy life on the water fresh air boat rides and sunshine celebrate the lake life and make memories limited property release august 21st Visit them at TennesseeNational.com, or better yet, give them a call, 865-657-2003. Oh, according to research, 82% of people remember radio ads. That means that 82% of you listening right now will remember that this is an ad for ZipRecruiter. If you're hiring, 82% of you will recall that ZipRecruiter makes hiring faster and easier. And 82% of you will note that you can try ZipRecruiter for free today. But you have to go to ZipRecruiter.com slash radio, like where this ad plays. 82% of you will keep in mind that ZipRecruiter's technology finds qualified people for your job and actively invites them to apply. Scott, is that you? Who are you talking to? <sighs> 82% of you will also know that I um live with my mom. But the most important thing to note is that ZipRecruiter works. In fact, four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. Will you be part of the 82% who remember where you can try ZipRecruiter for free? It's ZipRecruiter.com slash radio. Again, that exclusive link is ZipRecruiter.com slash radio. Yes, radio. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash radio. Fans, I'm here to talk about something awesome. The kind of awesome you've missed. The joy of tailgating, the energy, the feels of the vol walk, the roar when the tee opens, and the sweet sound of Rocky Top with 100,000 of your best friends. Saturdays and Neelan are back. Yeah, we get goosebumps thinking about it too. Experience the rich pageantry of vol football game days again. Log on to allvols.com for tickets today. At Firehouse Subs, a portion of every purchase helps provide life-saving equipment to first responders across the country. Like our new Chicken Euro Sub. It's not your everyday Euro. Piled high with perfectly grilled sliced chicken breast, cool, crisp cucumber, and crumbled feta cheese on a warm toasted sub roll with our zesty pepperoncini tzatziki spread. It's a -a one-of-a-kind burst of flavor that just keeps getting better with every bite. The new Chicken Euro Sub. Only from Firehouse Subs. Save time. Order on firehousesubs.com or on the app to
Uh, we also have Gators that are out here on the practice facility. I don't know if you saw like Donald Page and George Walker of the Tennessean. Yeah, I did see that. <laughs> These things are just chilling out here. There's like a pond. Well, there's a pond right behind the media tent. If you're watching on Zone TV, you can see. I mean, it's beautiful out here. The sun, the the facility, the Bucks facility. By the way, I know I talked about this yesterday, but this is this thing is drop dead gorgeous uh, for a team that sucked for forever. I guess the Glazers just have a ton of money. They, don't they own an EPL team too, Lucas? The Glazers, yes, uh, Manchester United. Manchester United. Yeah. So clearly they, they got they got bags. Only the most historic Premier League team in the history. Yeah. Only the best one. <laughs> or the, the most historic one, not best, but most historic. Um, so yeah, there's a there's a pond like behind the media tent, and there's just alligators like lurking around back there. Like behind with that Dexter backdrop that I had yesterday, I was legitimately worried that one was gonna like sneak up behind me. It's not like there's a fence snap separating us. From the uh, from these reptilian creatures, these dinosaurs that are just waiting to take a chunk out of my ankle, but we survived. I, I tweeted yesterday that I was going to turn one of them into a pair of boots, and then people immediately called me out because they know I'm a coward and I would never do such things. Yeah, you, you would see, run. You would run. Zero percent. I mean, I would run. I, I think would probably catch me. Alligators could move, man. They get going, chopping chopping those feet it's like a football player. Keep always forward, always in motion. Keep chopping. Um, but. Did you see this story in Salt Lake City? We'll get to the callers, and I, I know I've got a, a point that I have to make about Ryan Tannehill here in just a second. But the uh, the story out of Salt Lake City where this woman is handling an alligator in, like, one of these zoos. It's like scales and tails or something like that. Thing gets a hold of her arm, death rolls, and some dude, like just a patron, a visitor to the park, jumps on the alligator's back and is, like, able to help her free herself from the literal jaws of death. Uh, while she's getting her arm twisted up. I think, I mean, she obviously had surgery and it sounds like she gets to keep the arm, but like, I would never, ever, ever, there is, I'm such a coward. I would never be the person that jumps in the alligator tent. Every <laughs> Darwinism at that point. Sorry. You would just be, you know, oh my God, somebody help her. No, I'd take a video and I'd put it on TikTok or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> somebody do something. Somebody do something while I'm over here with my phone and my camera. <laughs> it's about the, Extent of my hero, uh, heroism, 615-737-1045. So the caller who uh, waited before break from Oak Grove was asking me my opinion of Ryan Tannehill. Listen, I, and I know some people have brought this up in the chat. Dude needs to do more in the playoffs. Like, it can't be the Derrick Henry show every time they get into the postseason. Because right now they're sitting at 2-2 two and two, uh, in the postseason. They, the run that they had in 2019 to the AFC Championship game, big, historic, huge. Uh, absolutely something that they could build upon the core, the bones of a successful championship contending team are obviously in place. And they've done things this off season to fortify that, but Ryan Tannehill in the postseason, that's why this mother bleeper thing with Tom Brady came up from the, from HBO's the shop where he's talking about, you're sticking with that mother bleeper. And people said, well, it can't be Tannehill because Tannehill is the one who just basically beat him in the playoffs. But like Tannehill in that playoff game, he did have a touchdown to Ferkser. He threw an interception. He had like 70 yards passing and the rest was Derek and, you know, the defense because Logan Ryan's pick six obviously ended Tom Brady's career as the as the New England Patriots quarterback in that 2019 postseason. But more than anything, Ryan Tannehill has the ability to to show us and everybody out there who discusses the Tennessee Titans because they are a run first team. You stop the Titans as the Baltimore Ravens did by stopping the run first. And you make Ryan Tannehill try to beat you. And if the run game isn't operating as efficiently as it does and as it has, then there are ways that you can poke holes in the armor of the Tennessee Titans. It is a run first team for a reason. It's not like Tannehill, Tannehill's not capable. You can't you can't say anything but heap glowing praise upon a, a quarterback who had four, who accounted for 40 total touchdowns last year. He's what makes the biggest difference in this offense. Derrick Henry and the running game and the principles that they run set things up for Tannehill to be able to maximize it. But it's about the ball placement. It's about the efficiency. And it's about the fact that he hangs in the pocket and stands and delivers so many times as we've seen him do. He's incredibly tough under pressure. But how they elevate further, because you've gone from Marcus Mariota and Derrick Henry, who whose level of play in the case of Marcus Mariota, was all but constipating the offense. They couldn't get anything done. Derrick Henry is nearly doubling his rushing average yards or his average rushing yards per game since the change has been made. 
Now Ryan Tannehill, outside of performing in the regular season and doing things like getting to the postseason and back-to-back years and winning division titles, things of this nature, they still need to find a way, or he needs to find a way, to further elevate himself. I, I believe that he's capable. Absolutely, I do. But at a certain point, he's going to come under some more, uh, much more heavy scrutiny by all of us in the media corps because wh- when you do these things and you, you get to the postseason and you have the success that they did in 2019, yeah, they're, they, they, will, they will satisfy the fan base's thirst for a while. But once it starts to become routine, and you become a, an organization that expects winning, as Mike Frabel and John Robinson have clearly set the precedent that they do, you can only, like getting to the postseason and winning divisions, even though it hasn't happened here for a while until recent memory, it's got to go further. This is the window that you have with the roster is currently constructed. Maybe they find ways in future years to sustain that, but at this, at this current juncture, Ryan Tannehill has the opportunity and will have the opportunity to show us and everybody else that he is more than just the point guard of this offense. It's okay to be the point guard of an offense when the offense is functioning at a high level, but at a certain point you need that point guard to make plays to put you above and beyond six, one, five, seven, three, seven, one, oh, four, five is the number six. 615-737-1045 is how get involved. Uh, we got Tommy in last Tennessee. That's the question about the Tommy. Mike Keith is excited for another season of Titans football. Bam! Yeah, we know how you feel, Mike. Catch Mike Keith and Coach Dave McGinnis with the call on Titans Radio. Your home for Titans football. 104.5 The Zone. I'm Amy Lawrence with this CBS Sports Minute, sponsored by Lexicon, your holistic provider of practice management software and legal support services. Terrell Owens says he can play right now at age 47. He tells TMZ he just ran a 4-4 40-yard dash in the last week that he's still in amazing shape. He may be one of the most polarizing athletes in the history of the NFL, but there's no doubting his work ethic or durability. Only once in his extensive career did he ever play in fewer than 14 games in a season. And while he's already into the Pro Football Hall of Fame, he claims it's just like riding a bike. He's far from washed up. T.O. running routes for the first time since 2010. Sign me up. His fire, intensity, competitive spirit, trash talking, even a step slow. He'd be compelling reality TV. So get your popcorn ready. I'm Amy Lawrence. Attorney Joe Cordell. For many men, divorce brings a bewildering sense of loss. You feel adrift, isolated, like you're the only person in the world. But the good news is, you're not alone. Cordell & Cordell is here to help. For more than 30 years, Cordell & Cordell has been there to guide men through all aspects of divorce. And we'll be there for you. Schedule an appointment with one of Cordell & Cordell's Nashville area attorneys. 810 Crescent Center Drive, Suite 160, Franklin, Tennessee, 37067. With Amdro, you can enjoy your backyard like never before. Our round-the-clock pest protection gives you the peace of mind to enjoy your great outdoors without a care in the world. Cannibal! Okay, we can't defend you against the splash zone. But when it comes to ants and other pests, we've got you covered 24-7. Find Andro in the insecticide aisle at your nearest retailer. I sold my home for more than I anticipated, and I got to decide when I was ready to move. I received my all-cash offer from Mark Spain Real Estate, and they let me move after I found my new home. They made it easy. Hey, this is Dawn Davenport, and that review is from listener Melinda from 104.5 The Zone. If you're like Melinda and you're ready to take advantage of this red-hot real estate market, the guaranteed offer from Mark Spain Real Estate makes selling your home easy and stress-free. No showings, no open houses, no stress. Don't worry about constant cleaning and costly repairs. 
offers to get your home ready to sell. Sell your home hassle-free with the strongest cash offer in the industry. The Wall Street Journal ranks Mark Spain Real Estate number one real estate team in the U.S. for closed transactions for the fourth year in a row. There are no showings, no open houses, no stress. It is that simple. Mark Spain Real Estate has earned over 6,000 five-star reviews. So sell your home with the most trusted real estate team. Go to MarkSpain.com today. MarkSpain.com to get a guaranteed offer on your home and start packing. Call 855-299-SOLD. Unused prescription opioid pain medicines can spell trouble. Safely dispose of opioids before they can hurt your family. Find a drug take-back option such as medicine drop boxes. Visit www.fda.gov slash drug disposal. A message from the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. We already know you love listening to your favorite radio station, 104.5 The Zone, and now you can enjoy listening to 104.5 The Zone and play free poker online. Go to 104.5thezone.com and click on the games tab to play free poker today against your friends. Show everyone who's the king of the table at 104.5thezone.com and play free poker. Listen to your favorite sports on 104.5thezone all day and play free poker. Fly drive to a card room or casino where you can play for free with your friends. Play in single games or tournaments, customize your avatar, and more. Go to 104.5thezone.com and click on the games tab, play poker, and listen to 104.5 The Zone. Sponsored by My Game Room, LLC. You have something special. You have greatness in you. Hello, this is Les Brown, and I'd like to invite you to join me and my friend, New York Times best-selling author of Rich Dad, Poor Dad, Robert Kiyosaki, at the Get Motivated Business Seminar, Thursday, September the 9th in Nashville. I'll be there with Tennessee Titans head coach Mike Varable and America's top experts on sales marketing, business skills, team building, and so much more. The best part is that it's only $9 $9 per person to attend and change your financial future. That's right, just $9. That's almost free, but you got to have some skin in the game. Go to getmotivated.com now to reserve your seats for the Get Motivated Seminar, Thursday, September the 9th at the Municipal Auditorium. I'll be there with Robert Kiyosaki and Coach Mike Verabel, and we want to see you there too. Go to getmotivated.com now. Come on, join me. You got to be hungry. One hour Mick, how do you hire heating and cooling technicians? Gotta look careful, Ryan. Is it hard? Finding new team members is the most important part of my job. How hard could it be? It's more about finding the right personality. Huh? We can teach you to fix air conditioners. That's the easy part. But I thought... To succeed at one hour, you need to put others first without even thinking about it. So not everyone makes the cut? Gotta look careful, Ryan. So you're saying... Background checks. Drug-free. Outstandingly reliable. Then you could be a one-hour tech? Then you get an interview. High standards. I send our team members into your home, Ryan. Standards cannot be high enough. I see what you mean. But if you share our commitment, you'll have a long, happy career at one hour. One hour is looking for one more technician to join our team. OneHourMick.com Always on time, or you don't pay a dime. Full-time hours, benefits, health care, the whole...
couple notches on our belt as far as just, you know, conditioning, effort in the game. You know, this is going to pay dividends for later. For later. But honestly, we do this because uh, when you're going against somebody that's not your team, uh, you know, you're just going to get higher, faster, more physical reps, and you can't duplicate these reps except in a game. And I think it's just another way for uh, guys that won't be playing in the preseason game to get some real game time reps. Um, you know, a lot of these guys I've played with uh, a ton before, but I haven't got to meet them personally either. So it's good to kind of, you know, meet the guys that you work with day in and day out. I, I think I think it shows the uh, the mentality of the team. You know what I mean? Because if you're able to go ahead and keep plugging people in and we're able to find success, I mean, it's only going to supercharge your offense when we get everybody back. The only thing we worry about is, you know, with guys constantly being out, you worry about condition, conditioning and that type of thing, which is why, you know, you hope to get everybody out here. But it just doesn't work that way. Everybody's body is different, heals certain ways. Um, but, you know, those guys are working as well. I mean, Coach Fravel does a great job of understanding uh, you know, for the injured guys, like, hey, you guys got to get this type of work if you're not going to play. And then, you know, we just we just hope that they get get healthy and come back and help us. But um, I think it's just, you know, continue to keep trucking. This is camp. It's hard. This is what's going to happen. And uh, we just got to keep plugging away. Um, Honestly, I think it's just great for precision, you know, getting all of our, our wide receivers back. But I would feel really, really great about that, uh, uh, getting some, some good reps with those guys. But at the end of the day, we got a game plan. And as long as we do the game plan, you're supposed to win, right? I'm sorry. Oh, this is two games right here. That's, that's how I figure it. I mean, honestly, we were over here moving the ball. We do situations. We do special teams. We do everything out here. Uh, so, I mean, certain guys need to be able to get that experience. And let's be, let's be real, taking away a preseason game makes it harder on those guys that may not make the team. So let's continue to give those guys the reps so that they could get a job somewhere else. That was a luxury we didn't have last year with COVID. I'm too old, man. I'm too old. I can't, I, I'm, you know, like, I look at it, I'm like, man, I'll get in there. And then I see that it's 50 yards away. And I'm just like, you know, maybe I'll just, maybe I'll just chill and rest. But, you know, it's part, it's part of the sport. You know, they came out today on fire. We had a really good day of practice yesterday. And that's what you want to see. People compete, keep a, car, keep a uh, fire. A lot of pushing, but no punches thrown. And as long as there's no punches thrown, then we're good, Jim. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, honestly, you know, it's a it's a great opportunity. I think that this is a great opportunity to play against the Super Bowl, uh, you know, uh, champion team, and uh, you know, it just lets you know that when you get these successful plays and you start making things happen in the red zone and you start to get movement in first and second down and you're protecting the quarterback, it shows that hey, you can play anybody. You can play with anybody. So we just got to keep continue to give ourselves a chance to be able to get to that level. Oh, yeah. So today was a little bit better. You know, yesterday after coming off of the flight, you know what I mean, not able to eat as much. Man, I lost 10 pounds yesterday. Today I'm probably, you know, five to seven, which which could be pretty much normal. But yesterday it was a little bit more. Uh, honestly, it's mostly water weight. So as long as you're drinking water and staying hydrated, eating some good food, you should be able to get it back pretty easily. Um, I know sometimes you wake up in the morning because your body does work for you at night when you sleep. You may lose a pound or two when you wake up. Oh, t t today I got six Gatorades in, which are, which is astounding to me because I usually try to stick to the water because Gatorade has so much sugar. But sometimes you need that sugar when you're producing out there. All right. I hope you guys enjoyed your new track. That was Titans offensive lineman Roger Saffold. That meant say he lost 10 pounds yesterday. By the way, welcome in final hour. Here on 104.5 The Zone, I know I got a little, Lucas, I got straight up fried by the heat out here. Like the, th the thing straight fried my technology. So it sounded like I got a little uh, Jim Wyatt robot voice, but we're back. We're better than ever. I've got a pirate ship in front of me straight up. This thing is on wheels. I may drive it home. Uh, rental car be damned. But yes, Titans offensive lineman, Roger Saffold, speaking with the media directly after practice. You'll hear from Jeffrey Simmons later on in the show. And we're also going to talk 
with uh, with uh, NFL Films Greg Cosell about Dylan Raidens and Rashad Weaver. Some preseason analysis by Greg about these two players and what makes them, what made them stand out in this game. Because a lot a lot of people looked at Dylan Raidens and were uh, less than impressed with his performance. But Greg kind of dispelled some of those notions that I think uh, that I think people were really really concerned about with the initial sack that they thought Dylan Raidens gave up. So we'll get to that. Later in the show. Yeah, it's hot as hell. So if Roger Saffold is losing 10 pounds, I don't feel as bad about my uh, my Zoom connection getting physically fried by the uh, 110 heat index out here at the Tampa Bay facility. But as long as we're back and we sound good now, then I'm happy. As long as Lucas is happy, I'm happy. But are you okay? Are you surviving? I'm happy. That was ultimate robot voice. That's as, as robot voice. That was like worse than Jim Wyatt robot voice. What did uh, what did you do? Did you did you like throw it? Th- how how did you handle this? Was this your moment? Was this was this the time when you unseat me from the throne? Y- yeah, you didn't hear me toss it to Saffold. Hell no, I couldn't hear anything. All I saw was, oh my god, I'm not on the air, and my music's playing, so I have to run <laughs> over here and find shelter uh, in this uh, in this vicious Tampa Bay heat. It was uh, yeah, Mike Mike Vrabel would have loved it. That was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> an absolute troll 615-737-1045 is how you jump in robot voice or otherwise we're back and better than ever here on 104.5 the zone presented by our friends at scoreboard bar and grill been a lot of fun today uh really appreciate john ledyard stopping by the tent but certainly the conversation now becomes about the depth guys about the work that they got in i want to uh i want to play jeffrey simmons press conference with the media later on in the show as well, because we haven't we haven't heard from Big Jeff in a while outside of his appearance with us. I think it was Monday, two Mondays ago, when he sat down at the uh, at the zone training camp table with us and spoke about all the things that have been going on with him. Um, more than anything, more than anything, I was really interested. Well, that's not true. I was going to say more than anything, I was interested in the offensive line versus the defensive line on both sides. For the Bucks and the Titans, given that both have pretty stout units up front, but like the uh, the highlights of Brady and these wide receivers versus the DBs really, uh, really grab gra- That's where my attention gravitated towards as the practices wore on. Six one five seven three seven one zero four five is how you jump in. We also have to talk about Julio Jones and AJ Brown because they haven't been practicing, and I feel like I feel like now is it's with not with Julio but with AJ. I want to know what's happening there because if it's a setback, fine, but there needs to be some acknowledgement that there's been a bit of a setback. Yeah. He went through practice on Monday at the stadium. A lot of people got to see AJ Brown, but he just really did individual drills. And then he sat the rest of it out. It was him and Julio chilling on the sideline. They throw him up on the scoreboard and the fans would cheer, but they're cheering because they see them, not they're cheering because they're doing stuff on the field. That's where, that's where my greater concern comes in with AJ Brown. Now I'm not like, I'm not telling you sound the alarm. AJ Brown is dealing with, knee complications again it's not what i'm saying but if that's not the case then what is a what is how why is aj brown being managed the way that he is and also ben jones who we haven't seen in quite some time that is a critical piece of that offensive line in fact i i don't know that i would argue that ben's the most important piece but maybe i would given how bad daniel munyer has been in front of ryan Tannehill without Ben Jones on the field. He got tangled up a couple of weeks ago uh, in practice. He celebrated a touchdown, and then we didn't see him anymore. We haven't seen him for basically almost two weeks at this point. So we'll get into that as well. We're also going to have a deep dive analysis with Greg Cosell of Dylan Radens and Rashad Weaver, your reaction to what's going on with Julio Jones and A.J. Brown. Are you concerned? And at what point do you become concerned? Because I think that, for the people who are monitoring the wide receiver situation, for the people who are looking at their star-studded offense and saying, yeah, you know, we're uh, easily, the Titans are going to be able to throw up 30 points and north of 30 points per game again. I just, I, I want to know how they, like a temperature check, basically, given that A.J. Brown and Julio Jones have not been out on the field and done, like, legitimate work in quite some time. How is the fan base feeling? 615-737-1045. we got a lot more show to do and a lot more fun. 
to have and certainly no more heat. So I had to move away from the palm tree backdrop. Now I just have the reflection of the palm trees in front of me off the bucks. Like this is, I guess, where their locker room is. They have a whole building just for their locker room. Like it's separate from the practice facility. I really can't get over how nice the bucks facility is. Anyway, we'll come back. We'll have all of those discussions coming up next. I'm Buck Rising. This is 104.5 The Zone live from Tampa Bay presented by Scoreboard Bar and Grill. Coming up today on the 3HL. A Thursday full of Austin Huff's rants about sports or history or who knows. Who knows? Seriously, uh, Sean Pendergast from Houston will join us to talk about the Texans and Deshaun Watson. And we got VFL Jason Swain from the Swain event coming to talk about the Vols two weeks away from the start of football. Two weeks, y'all. It's football time! In Tennessee. Hey, thanks, Babs. See, I don't hate the balls. Today, starting at 3 p.m. on 104.5 The Zone.
asking myself every time we go to commercial break. Welcome back in. 104.5 The Zone, live from Tampa Bay. Presented by Scoreboard Bar and Grill. Trying to make sure that not only that I don't overheat, but that the equipment doesn't overheat so that it doesn't sound like I'm physically being fried on the air. Now, Lucas, there has been a positive development in this regard. I've discovered I found a new location where there's shade, there's breeze. It's directly in front of the giant Tampa Bay Bucks flag, the one that's big enough to wrap around my house three times. And there is also a giant cooler directly behind me filled with all manner of goodies. So uh, I think we're going to be fine the rest of the way through the show. Is the cooler about it. like a you know public cooler for media, or is it just unguarded and you were just helping yourself? Oh, no, it's unguarded. Uh, everybody is cleared out at this point. I'm just waiting for uh, you know Bruce Arians or somebody on the Bucks staff to come over here and mother bleep me for still being <laughs> on their field. But, yes, I've commandeered their pirate ship, and I've commandeered their cooler, and I'm quite happy about it. 615-737-1045 is how you get involved. 615-737-1045 is the number. So. We ended last segment talking about A.J. Brown. Now, it's my understanding that A.J. Brown gets to kind of, you know, has input on his maintenance days in the same way that Julio Jones does. And Mike Vrabel did not say that during his press conference, and I did go back and listen to some of it, what was available uh, before their stream went down. So, you know, the good news is not just us that are getting at our equipments out here getting toasted, but the Titans as well. Um, but his comments, you know, immediately deflected about, well, everybody's on an individual plan and I'm paraphrasing yada, 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 but it's my understanding that AJ Brown also in the same way that Julio Jones does has input on days, you know, how much work he's doing, how, how hard he's maybe not how hard he's going. Cause when he's out there, he kill he's, you know, straight murdering defensive backs on the field, but I don't know how I feel about that. Like I, I understand that maintenance days are important. I understand that the human body is only able to withstand or should only be able to withstand so much punishment that these guys put themselves through hell each and every day playing the sport. But I also, you know, I kind of, I kind of have a little bit of a, it's weird. I kind of feel like an old person about this. Like, Hey, you know, go out there and play, like be competitive about it. If you're right, Get out there and get after it. This is Tom Brady and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. These are the defending Super Bowl champions. If you are close to right, I mean, Josh Reynolds playing through an Achilles injury right now. And A.J. Brown's taking these days off. No, nobody's questioning that A.J. Brown's not way more important. I'm not questioning A.J.'s toughness or anything like that. The dude's a stud. But that does linger in the back of my mind with A.J., and, and how I feel about, you know, him having him having say in the same way that a 10-year vet and, you know, a first ballot Hall of Famer like Julio does too. Now, I don't know what to, to what extent that goes, but that was just kind of the impression that I, having some conversations with some people, that I was left under. 615-737-1045. Now, what this does open up is opportunity for other guys to get reps, critical reps, if you're trying to develop position depth, specifically at wide receiver. Now, Ryan Tannehill spoke about this yesterday because he spoke about Marcus Johnson yesterday. Ryan Tannehill did not speak at the podium today. He spoke yesterday. Um, but Ryan Tannehill, on this particular subject matter, has been really impressed with the guys that he has had out on the field because it's putting a lot more pressure on the quarterback, too, to try and elevate these guys. This was Ryan Tannehill yesterday. What the days, Chester Rogers, Marcus Johnson, what was clicking for you guys? Uh, guys competed. You know, it was, uh, it was a good day. Overall, it's definitely some things we need to clean up. Got to be better on third down. You know, I didn't think we played very good on third down um, really at any point today. But guys came out and they competed. You know, it's it hot out here. There was no excuses. Just guys dug deep and uh, found a way to make plays. You know, some big plays early on. You know, Nick made a big one down the field. Mike Marcus made some plays. Chester made some plays competing. Um, you know, even in one-on-one. It started off a little slow, but once guys got going, then, you know, built some confidence and, and started making some plays. So, Look forward to, uh, to building on it tomorrow. And they did that. That was Ryan Tannehill yesterday speaking with the assembled media. Now, Marcus Johnson, so I tweeted out that the top wide receivers, the top three wide receivers didn't practice today for the Titans. And I don't necessarily know that people caught on that I was talking about Julio Jones, A.J. Brown, and Marcus Johnson. Because Josh Reynolds, Nick Westbrook, Nick Westbrook, Akina, Chester Rogers, Cam Batson, Mason Kinsey, all these guys out here going through the motions. Well, not going through the motions, but going through the practices 
in a way that the uh, current top three for the Titans has not been. Marcus Johnson did get some good work in, though, yesterday. That's what this is about. Now, Des Fitzpatrick continues. You notice that I didn't bring up Des Fitzpatrick's name in either of those conversations because in watching them out on the field, you know, this coaching staff is is on everybody. Like, it does not discriminate in terms of who gets coached hard and who doesn't, right? Because there's not really that. That's why Mike Vrabel in the, at halftime of a preseason game of a first preseason game is bitching out Brett Kern because everybody gets coached hard. That's the kind of precedent they set. That's a Belichick thing. And maybe it's just part of Vrabel's personality too, not to draw an unnecessary correlation between them. But like that was always the story with Brady and Belichick. But Bill Belichick would get into Tom Brady because it not only was necessary, but because it sets a good example for, you know, nobody's above criticism in this organization. And that's kind of the way the Titans operate too, but man, uh, Des Fitzpatrick, I don't know if they'd need to pare down his workload. Like, and what I mean by that, not how much he's doing, like not from a standpoint of, okay, like a half a practice, like some, some of the vets do, but in what they're asking him to do and what they're asking him to learn with this Titans wide receiver core. The thing with Des Fitzpatrick is they've been trying to teach him all three positions and he doesn't seem like he's capable at this point, maybe at some point, but at this point, he doesn't seem like he's capable of handling all of what they're trying to, all of what they're trying to teach him again today, significant struggles. And, uh, and, you know, I, I can't report on interactions between the coaches and the players, but uh, they weren't pleased <laughs> with what was happening with Des Fitzpatrick on the field. Now, speaking of this rookie class, you know, expectations for them are going to be, I don't know if higher is the right word, but like there is going to be a hyper-focus on this rookie class, right? Because of the way that last year's, for whatever reason, underperformed. This brings up two guys in particular, Dylan Radins and Rashad Weaver. So Greg Cosell was on the install, of course, the install with Greg Cosell, every episode's every Wednesday. Just because I'm on the road doesn't mean that uh, all of the responsibilities that I have just stop cold. We did the install out here yesterday at the Bucks practice facility. In fact, it looked aesthetically fantastic because I had the clouds above me, palm trees behind me, and Greg talking ball. So Fitzpatrick, you're, you're looking at warily. Caleb Farley, you understand where he is in his progression. Elijah Molden, you know, you've seen some stuff. He's, he's, and these, these reps out here, out here today for Farley and Molden, so, so important for them to be able to advance and grow their game the way that I think Titans fans want them to. But then there's Dylan Radins and Rashad Weaver. Now, Rashad Weaver, the story of, of last week's preseason game, and probably the biggest story last week, just because of the position that he plays in a team that so desperately needs pass rush. But I want to start with Cosell's analysis of Dylan Radins. Because what I asked him about Dylan Radins was, you know, I started to get into it. I started to say, yeah, you know, Greg, he gave up. They had him at guard for the first two series. Then they moved him out to tackle and he was fine. And he gave up the one sack at guard. And Greg very quickly stopped me and said, no, no, no. He didn't give up that sack. And then broke down the analysis of what he saw from the Titans second round pick. I mean, just looking at him, okay. Yeah. Obviously, we know he's not playing against the number ones, and but just watching him, I thought he played well. Now, I can't imagine he's going to be a starter at guard. They have Nick Davis at right guard and Seth Hold at left guard. I, they're the starters, I, you Correct. know, barring any barring an injury. So he's not going to beat out either one of those guys. So essentially, I think he was drafted to play right tackle because they lost Dennis Kelly. I mean, I know they still have Quisenberry. I know they still have Sombreo, but I think he was ultimately drafted to play right tackle. And he started the third series at right tackle. I thought he played well. Um, I thought as a run blocker, they asked him to do a number of things. He had to make some drive and base blocks where it, where it was play side and he had to come off the ball with some leverage and power. I thought he showed some sustainability doing that. The other thing is, is they're a predominant zone run team. So he, when the run is away from him, he has to work to the second level very often. And I thought he showed good, good athleticism and mobility. Those are very difficult blocks, Buck, when you have to block a moving linebacker who's a better athlete than you are, and you have to try to at least get a body on him with balance and body control. You know, those are hard blocks. The guy's a better athlete than you are but I thought he, he did a good job. Um, there was only one play where I thought he did not execute his assignment. 
there was a, a one yard loss by Sargent um, in the second quarter. And that was, in my view, based on tape study, I thought that was Raiden's responsibility. Um, he did not execute his blocking assignment. He had the play side stacked backer and he went to the defensive end who I believe uh, the, the tight end was responsible for the defensive end. And, but he went to the, um, uh, he went to the defensive end instead of the stack backer. And then you, you talk about uh, his pass protection. I thought he showed good knee bend, good balance in both his 45 degree and vertical pass sets. He was efficient with his kick slides. His base was firm. His hands were in good position to strike. I, I thought just, as I said, studying him and looking at the technique, putting aside who he's playing against, uh, because you have to start somewhere, Buck. That's the thing. Absolutely. You know, when he gets graded, and I don't know who the offensive line coach is. You do, I'm sure. I don't know who it is. Keith um, Carter, formerly of the Falcons, ironically enough. Okay, Keith Carter. He's not going to say to Dylan Radens, he's not going to say, you know, oh, you were playing against, you know, a guy who's not a starter. He's not going to say that. He's going to evaluate how Dylan Radens played. And that's, and, that's been... trying, and that's what I'm trying to do. And I thought Dylan Radens played well. And that's... So that's Greg Cosell, his analysis of Dylan Radens. That's from the install today's episode on the 104.5 the, uh, the Zone podcast feed. Certainly a very, very cool, uh, a very, very cool breakdown because that's what, you know, that's the first thing that I saw when, when they started that first series against Atlanta. I saw Dylan Raines, the dude that he was blocking, get by him, not like blow by him, but get by him and give up a sack. And so immediately I tweeted out incorrectly, as Greg has just pointed out, that Dylan Raines gave up a sack playing right guard. And so Greg broke down that this is why the, the install with Greg Cosell is so critical, even for me, who's been, you know, I'm paid to watch football. I think I understand football at a, you know, I'll say I got my bachelor's degree, uh, degree in football and Greg's got his doctorate, but the, the difference in the blocking assignments and what he's being asked to do from a technical standpoint is what really pops on Raiden's. Now I, when, when I did my three HL hit on Monday from the stadium practice, Don Davenport was kind of dismissing um, Don Davenport was kind of dismissing, you know, the level of competition that they're facing. Well, these guys aren't good. You know, a lot of them aren't going to make an NFL roster. A lot of these dudes aren't going to uh, a lot of these dudes aren't starting NFL caliber player, but it's not about that. It's not about that at all for either side. It's about the technical, the technicalities of the position that each man on the field is asked to play. That's why not, that's why they're not running schemes because they're just focused on. Okay. Did this right tackle hit his pass set correctly based on the timing of the three of the three step drop of the quarterback? Right. There are so many different in uh, what's what's the word interconnected parts of a single football play that the that, that the pass set is different on a three step drop, a five step drop or a seven step drop. So if the quarterback holds the ball too long on a three step drop and that player gets the sack, well, the, the it's not because the tackle. Well, the guard had bad protections because the quarterback held the ball. Marcus Mariota, 11 sacks against the Baltimore Ravens, exacerbated by a quarterback who, in the words of Mike Vrabel in that 2018 season, they were just looking for him to let it rip. And Marcus at times wouldn't. That creates additional scrutiny unfairly, as we've talked about Dylan Raidens on the offensive line. Now, we went into much further detail about Dylan Radens, which is why you need to listen to this episode, but I also want you guys to hear Greg Cosell's analysis of Rashad Weaver because Rashad Weaver is a fifth-round pick, has the ability to play a critical role in this defensive rotation, but the variety of different things that they're asking him to do that we've talked about, that they've worked with him on at the Senior Bowl, make him a big-time asset for this team. This was Cosell on yesterday's episode of The Install talking about the Titans edge rusher out of Pitt. Well, what the tape showed to me, and I think this is a positive, is he looked very much like he did at Pitt because he's a player. He's not a quickness explosion player. He's not a bender. He's not flexible. He's not purely explosive. What he is, is he's a player with strong, heavy hands and natural power. That's how he played at Pitt. That's how he looked in this preseason game. Um, and what was really interesting to me is he, I think he played 41 snaps and mm -hmm. uh, and there were snaps in which they moved him inside, by the way, in the sub nickel front. And I think that'll be interesting to see if they do that 
assuming he makes the team uh, and if he becomes part of the rotation when the regular season starts, if they do that and they move him inside. But putting aside those plays, and there might have been 10 or 12 of those, um, the rest of the plays except one, he always lined up to the boundary side of the formation, the short side of the field. And that's interesting. And the reason that's interesting is because when he was in the base defense, meaning a 5-2 or a 3-4, whatever people want to call it, it's essentially a 5-2 front because there's five players on the ball and two stack backers. But the reason that's important is when you're playing to the boundary as the outside line of scrimmage player on the ball, then you're the edge setter in the run game because the corner can't be because the corner has got to run with the receiver. If the receiver runs vertically on the boundary side of the field, the corner has got to run with him. So he's the edge setter in the run game. And that's, that's a big responsibility because you can't let anyone get outside of you. But I thought he looked very much like he did in college. You saw the heavy hands, you saw the power. Um, and, and that's what he is. He's an on the ball player. We might have spoken about this. He's, he was not going to be a stack backer. He's right. going to play on the ball. Yeah. And and the, you're speaking to your earlier point about the snaps that he did play inside, the, the dozen or, or less than a dozen that he played inside. That's something that Mike Vrabel and John Robinson worked with him on at the Senior Bowl to see if he was willing to get inside and play across the front as they may look at yeah, I think he him can do it, that. try to get versatile. I think he can do it. He plays off contact well. Um, I think he could be effective in the stunt game. Now, in the stunt game, there's a picker, and he's the guy who goes first. And then there's the looper, the guy who loops around. To me, he'd be more effective as the picker, the guy who goes first, because that's where his power shows up. The looper has to have more flexibility to his core and his body. And Weaver's not that guy, in my view, anyway. That is Greg Cosell on this week's episode of The Install, breaking down Dylan Radens and Rashad Weaver. All five first-round quarterbacks who the Titans may see at some point throughout the course of the season is what Greg and I talked about this week as well. Make sure you go check out that podcast wherever it is that you get your podcast. So while you while you may have to temper your expectations about your first-round pick, Caleb Farley, it sounds like there's a lot of promise in these two players that we're discussing right now. And that may be the case for Elijah Molden as well. We will see. That may be – I mean, Racy, Racy McMath has a lot of work to do to get back into this competition at wide receiver, by the way unless he is just special teams God amongst man, which he may be um, Nick Westbrook Aquino offers them more from an all around standpoint. And that uh, my position has changed on that over the course of the last couple of weeks. So when, when discussing this rookie class in particular, understanding the kind of scrutiny that you're going to have on them because of how poorly last year's class performed, be it, you know, Isaiah Wilson reasons or injuries or everything else that kind of compounded to make last year's class on the whole. And listen, I'm, I'm talking about within the context of last season. I'm not saying that every one of them from Isaiah Wilson on down to Chris Jackson was a bust, but I'm saying that the impact of that rookie class last year was fairly negligible. And so you're looking for them to take strides this year. 615-737-1045. If you would like to get involved, 615-737-1045. More than anything though, that's what this preseason is about. For these guys who are trying to develop their their roles on their roster on this roster, I am I'm made to feel so much better about the absence of Julio Jones and AJ Brown because of Marcus Johnson and Chester Rogers. I think that the secondary, while it will have a deep set of players back there, once everybody is right, I still I look at Kayla Farley and I'm I I can't tell you how many times I want to say just as I've just as I've talked about Julio Jones not practicing and try to get Titans fans to back off the idea that the of getting bent out of shape about him specifically right now, I would say temper your expectations about Caleb Farley until such time as he can get comfortable playing real life football again. And it's not like he's uncomfortable playing real life football again. It's just that he hadn't done it in two years and then he looks like it. So I had a question last night on my A to Z sports primetime show about does Caleb Farley look like a first round pick? And my answer was, I mean, yeah, you know, he looks like a first round pick that hasn't played football since 2019. And that is trying to not necessarily relearn his position, but relearn the nuances of what it is that makes that position. 615-737-1045. We will continue talking about this all week long. The show will be live from Tampa Bay for one more day. And then of course, Titans radio broadcasting from the Buccaneer stadium. 
which you can hear this game between the Titans and the Bucks, and we'll see what progress guys like Dylan Radens, Des Fitzpatrick, maybe even Elijah Molden, who didn't play in the first preseason game, uh, Rashad Weaver, Monty Rice, who, by the way, was back out on the field after being helped off with what looked like a pretty bad injury yesterday. He returned to the practice field today and was out there working throughout the entirety of the practice. Makes you feel much better about the situation that was ongoing. We will come back. We will wrap up the show. We will do some poll questions on the other side. I'm Buck Rising. This is 104.5 The Zone. The Titans are in Tampa against the Super Bowl champion Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Yeah, it's the preseason. But, hey, it's Tom Brady. Mike Keith and Coach Mack have the kickoff Saturday night at 6.30. Throws a man down and goes out of bounds at the 40. On your home for Titans football and flagship for Titans radio, 104.5 The Zone.
the the show will be down in Tampa Bay tomorrow as well, but just, you know, for the safety and security of the hotel room, because I can't put Lucas through another day of this. He's been, he's been a good, he's been a good soldier, but this is good preparation for the football season, buddy. It's just, you know, it's not every day that I'm going to be sitting out in 110 degree heat index and my equipment's going to get fried. So during the football season, when I'm on the road, it will make life much, much easier on everybody involved. We appreciate everybody's patience today as well. I know it's been a little wonky, but I think I honestly, you know, I know Lucas probably hates it, but I think it makes live radio fun. You know, just the ability to kind of vamp and do things on the fly. And you don't, you know, I mean, ideally you would like to know that you're on the air at all times when you know you're going to be on the air and the safety and security of that. But I, uh, I don't know. I like a little chaos. I like to, I like to shake things up a little bit. And regardless, it's been great content that we've been able to get out here. So well worth it. And all presented by our friends at Scoreboard Bar and Grill. Food, drinks, sports, music, the world's largest selection of bushwhackers. Scoreboard Bar and Grill is the joint that you got to be watching Titans games at or going out and seeing a live show. They, uh, I looked up, I looked, up, I'm going to go to Scoreboard Bar and Grill, by the way, when I get home, because they have, they have the spasmatics out there every Sunday. I love the spasmatics. And I don't like seeing, I mean, Doghouse on dog house on the Mumbrian is a good time, but the acoustics in there, they kill me. It's so loud. You have to scream over everybody. So I know scoreboard bar and grill is going to be the joint that I go to watch one of my, uh, one of my favorite local bands. In the meantime, the show is uh, going to conclude here in the second, but we have to go about our daily custom, which is of course, to do the polls. I'm going to make you an offer. You can't refuse because the polls have closed the votes have been tallied it's time for a poll update and he's a good boy buck rising show producer and correspondent lucas panzica the father music makes me laugh right now i saw a tweet from v love yesterday he was in paradise park after the soccer game what by the way who won nashville sc orlando it was a one one draw god yeah bless but <laughs> but and i ran into v love at the soccer game but uh, well, we got poured on too. Yeah. So he went to Paradise Park afterwards and he tweeted out, he tweeted out a, the, the uh, Don Corleone gif saying, you know, every time he walks into the uh, Paradise Park, that's not the OG Paradise Park. And it's just the Don Corleone after Sonny's been killed. Look how they massacred my boy. <laughs> <laughs> Gets me every time. <laughs> it was great. Great to see V Love at a Nissan stadium. It was insanely wet and rainy. Uh, probably should have gotten the three points out of it, but Nashville got some help. And with the loss by NYCFC moves up to sole possession of second place in the Eastern conference table. Look at that wedding football in music city, even without a win. All right, go ahead. How much is your confidence in the Titans defense risen throughout training camp through the roof, rising steadily, cautiously optimistic, or we still suck. 30 or majority 51% are cautiously optimistic. 39% say it's rising steadily. 5% confidence through the roof and 5% think the Titans defense still sucks. So largely 90% of the audience pretty measured. How about that? How about that? By the way, don't put we from my Twitter account. Damn it, Lucas. It's it's the fans. It's the fans are voting. So they're reading it as we No, I don't know. I have mixed emotions about that. But anyway, uh, yeah, cautiously optimistic is how you should be. Like, you don't know what the product on the field is going to look like till they play a game, right? And really, until about the, I tell you about this with the offense and just about the football team as a whole. Like, don't ask me for record predictions. Don't ask me for any, any of that kind of stuff because it's meaningless. What I say right now, I mean, not what I say right now. I think everything that between 10 and 1 that I say matters very much right now. But um, about the defense, like, you don't know really what it's going to look like until about a month into the season. And then you can really project – you know, pending injuries, what exactly you can expect from this unit, how much more improved they will be, or if they don't improve, why they are not improved. Um, I think there's a, there's a great deal of, uh, there's a great deal of analysis that has to kind of wait in a way that people don't want it to wait, but the way that they've performed out here and throughout the course of training camp, I am a, uh, you know what, on, on the scale of those, if we're talking through the roof, rising steadily, cautiously optimistic, and, uh, and they still suck. I think I'm kind of rising steadily. I'm the same way. I mean, that's been the story of camp. It's true. Is the Vols QB job Joe Milton's to lose? 83% say yes. 
It sounds like it, man. That that clip we played from Alex Golish, the Vols' offensive coordinator, early in the show is a trip. Sounds like so. It sounded like a like a verbal love letter to Joe Milton about <laughs> you know playing the game of football and what they look for. Yeah, yeah, all that crap matters, but uh, as I say, all that crap. But I just. I, I was surprised by how effusive he was, and maybe we should have been paying attention to that. I mean, we've all we've been saying Joe Milton basically since he transferred, right? Like this is not a surprise to anybody. Yeah, that you've seen that meter kind of rising uh, as he's gotten more practice reps in and more time has passed. Everybody kind of rose their eyebrows a little bit when they brought somebody in because it felt like you told something or it you know told something about what the staff thought about the quarter. It's like that quarterback room was packed, and then they brought another guy in. They used a scholarship for another quarterback. That right there was telling, and then. From what's happened in fall camp, that's what all signs point to. He also I, looks like a creative player in Madden. I think it's disappointing, though. I really wanted to see more of Harrison Bailey. Maybe that's just because he looks like a prototypical quarterback at the pro level, but this is not the pro level. This is the college level. Josh Heupel needs the quarterback that's going to make it, the offense work as best as humanly possible to cover up what you know projects as an unholy bad defense this year. Which Titans draft pick has the biggest impact this coming season? Caleb Farley, Rashad Weaver, Dylan Radins, or Elijah Molden? 49% say it's Weaver. 34% of over 500 votes say it's Farley. 10% Molden, 7% Radins. No love for Des Fitzpatrick, huh? Uh, there's only four we, options. Yeah, okay, fair enough. Um, you know, Anything Monty things- Rice would have been the, the other one to put in there because we've seen what Des Fitzpatrick has offered. So far in camp. I mean, he had one nice catch today. Um, it was a contested catch. I thought he made a good play on the ball. I thought I liked the way that he worked the DB down the field in the uh, red zone drills. But other than that, I was just kind of, you know, there's nothing. There's not, not, not a ton there to work with. But, I mean, Weaver, because of the position he plays, I think has the best chance. I mean, Farley, though, if he's a starting corner, then you would immediately say Farley. Last one of the day. Who is Jack Brady's favorite Patriot? The son of Tom Brady, about 500 votes. 87% say it's Mike Vrabel over Tom Brady. Well, Mike Vrabel agrees. Mike Vrabel out here trolling the greatest quarterback in the history of man by tweeting a picture that uh, I think Donald Page took of Brady. Who I got a video of Brady throwing to his son today, which was a lovely moment. And then, uh, and then after the practice yesterday, Brady and Vrabel and Jack Brady gathered at midfield. And Vrabel took that opportunity to go on social media and troll his former teammate and say, yeah, Jack Brady's favorite former Patriot is, of course, me, Mike Vrabel, Titans head coach, and also pictured Tom Brady. <laughs> Outstanding. It was a lot of fun. Listen, for all for, from NPR and ASMR radio to my equipment getting fried by heat, I had a hell of a time out here. I know Lucas is probably miserable. He's <laughs> just shaking, shaking a fist at the sky. It wasn't that bad. <laughs> But I had fun. I had a great time. Now, yeah, a little chaos was, is good. Yeah, chaos is good. You know, it's like uh, it's like it's like Game of Thrones. A lot of Game of Thrones here uh, references lately. But it's like Game of Thrones when Littlefinger is saying to Varys, Varys, chaos in the pit. Chaos is a ladder. And you know what we did with the ladder? We climbed the holy hell out of the ladder. We survive. We thrive. We continue our coverage down here from Tampa Bay. I will be live from Tampa Bay tomorrow. All of it presented by Scoreboard Bar and Grill. And, of course, we'll be at the Bucks titans preseason game here in Tampa um, as we get closer and closer to the regular season. We're getting closer and closer to Blaine and Mickey because they're going to continue your entertainment for the rest of the afternoon. And it just so happens that they're coming up next. Tannehill, Julio Jones, and Derrick Henry. They live here. I mean, like, not really, like, here in the building, but you know what we mean. On the Titan Station. 104.5 The Zone.